You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, everybody in the world, and welcome to the Common Descent Podcast. This is episode 176. On this podcast, we talk about all sorts of topics in paleontology, evolution, life history, earth history, and every now and then, almost by necessity, we talk about dinosaurs. Yeah. This episode is hadrosaurs. Which is a good group of dinosaurs. A very cool group of dinosaurs. These are your duck-billed dinosaurs, the group that includes Parasaurolophus and Myosaur and Hadrosaurus. We'll also talk in this episode about other ornithopods, mm -hmm. your Iguanodons and your Hypsilophodons and things like that. Like with most of our dinosaur episodes, uh, we like to keep it pretty simple and straightforward. We'll talk about what they are, what makes them unique, a bit about what we know of their evolution, and then we'll zero in on a few of the features that make this group of dinosaurs extra special and cool and sometimes mysterious. Yeah. Hadrosaurs are one of those sort of unsung members of the dinosaur family. Not nearly as flashy as some of the others we've done episodes about, but no less interesting. Definitely underrated. And of course, we'll be talking about this episode topic because it was requested. Every one of our main series episodes of the podcast is a topic requested by our listeners. Every now and then we've done episodes in the past where we take a moment to highlight that the episode we're doing is the most requested episode to date. Yep, yep. The last time we actually mentioned that was the Tyrannosaurus episode, episode 120, which had 14 requesters encouraging us to do that episode since then we've actually beaten that record twice <laughs> uh toothed whales had 17 total requests although it was a bunch of different requests for various toothed whales yes and monotremes had like 25 requests yep, so. that was a big one we didn't mention it at the time whoops i that, forget to count <laughs> that was a big one that was pretty good uh well now it doesn't matter because we are breaking the record again hadrosaurs or in a few cases ornithopods or crested dinosaurs was requested by the following 28 people. <laughs> Barbara, Christoph, Dynomite, Aaron R., Levin, Brad, Abby, W.C., James, Jonathan, Evan, Rook Scoot, Science Skink, Devo, Tracy, Aaron B., Hadley, Holly, Nelio, Jackson, Tater Boy, Jesse, Dan, Michael, Shift, <gasps> Milu, Serpentine, and Dylong. <laughs> ridiculous our community is united yes behind a cause and the cause is hadrosaurs <laughs> thank you all so much uh sorry you had to wait all the way to episode 176 for the, the dinosaur that you wanted so much for us to talk about uh you're in luck we're gonna have an excellent conversation after the announcements in the news about hadrosaurs but let's start with those announcements first and foremost we have a patreon and our, the support we get on Patreon allows us to do everything with the podcast. Patrons who support us get access to all sorts of cool extra stuff like bonus content, live streams with us. One of the rewards you can get as a patron is that we'll shout your name out here at the start of the episode. More this names. episode, more names. We would like to welcome Paul, Forrest, Linda, Cheryl, and Buttonstuck. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your support. We really appreciate it. Hey, speaking of Patreon, we've been doing a bunch of new things on Patreon. We added two new tiers to our Patreon tiers, which means that there are now higher tiers than there have been before. The Kingdom and Phylum tier with all new benefits for people to enjoy. And along with that, uh, you will hear something a little bit different and new at the very end of the podcast. Indeed. And... In conjunction with launching some new tiers and celebrating our recent achievement of hitting 500 total patrons, we're doing a giveaway through our Patreon. If you are a patron by the end of this year, you will have a chance to win some fabulous prizes, including honorary membership to the top tier on our Patreon, including all the goodies that come with that. If you're interested in learning more about that, check out links in the episode description to Patreon or our website or our social media. We've put that information up in all the places. And on the note of special things that are going on, this episode comes out in October, which means it is spooky season. Spooky! By the time this episode comes out, two episodes of Spooky will already have been released. 
with two of our speculative evolution discussions on our chosen group of monsters, which this year is dragons. Which has been so much fun. We've been having a ton of fun. We had a ton of fun making the episodes, and it's been a ton of fun releasing them and having people comment and respond. And there has been a ton of great dragon conversation going on on our Discord in the Spooky channel. If you haven't already listened to them, check them out. As of the release of this episode, there are two more episodes coming out in October, and then we have our spooky live stream on November 11th. Once again, find uh, all that info on our website. And one more thing, uh, we got mail. We did. We got a bunch of cool mail. On our website, we have a mailing address uh, that people can use to send us uh, stuff if they want. We got some mail. We got a bunch of stuff that uh, came from Washington that has a business card that says Anomalite. So presumably Anomalite uh, perhaps is the person who sent all these cool stickers and stuff. Yeah, some really fun paleo art. Thank you for that. And we got a packet of cool stuff from Elizabeth uh, from New Jersey. Pictures and a postcard and also a really cool pin with Hadrosaurus on it. Very fitting. Uh, Extremely topical. Way to go, Elizabeth, being on the ball. Elizabeth had no idea we were going to do this. I don't think Elizabeth was even one of those names we shouted out. But thank you for uh, all the things that you sent. Yes. No, this is it's always exciting when we get mail. If you'd like to send us some physical mail and you don't have to, but we like it, uh, you can find that address on our website. Links in the episode description. Yeah, we can put up pictures of that so you can see the neat stuff we got. Yes. And those are the announcements, which means it's time for the news. Every episode, we like to cover some recent news, recent studies and updates from paleontology and related sciences to keep everybody up to date and give us some cutting edge stuff to talk about. Will, uh, what news have you brought? I have news about glowing mammals. All right, great. Yeah. We talked about this in the biofluorescence and luminescence episode. That was episode 157. This is research that has identified a whole bunch of other biofluorescent mammals. This was in the news not too long ago, where it was a study that was like, hey, look, a handful of mammals are biofluorescing, and we didn't expect that. This seems like it's, oh, hey, here's a whole bunch more. Yep, like over a hundred. Whoa, okay, (laughs) awesome. This research is by Kenny Traboyan et al. in the Royal Society of Open Science, and the article we'll be linking to in the blog is by Felicity Nelson in Science Alert. So... First off, background biofluorescence is not when you produce light by yourself, like bioluminescence, but when you are hit by usually UV light and then glow a different color because of reactions with molecules in your body. This is something well known in animals and found in tons of different groups, but until fairly recent years, wasn't as known in mammals and More recently, we've been discovering more and more mammals that show biofluorescent glowing patterns or portions of their body. This includes things like the platypus, which was one of the famous ones that got everyone's attention. Wombats, flying squirrels, rabbits. We even show biofluorescence. Mm -hmm. This research was wanting to look into it a bit further because it's not known how widespread, like in how many different mammal groups it's present. Right. We only know of it in the ones that we've checked. Yes. And so like, is this in certain parts of mammalia? Is this in certain kinds of mammals? And it is still extremely unclear why they biofluoresce. Mm-hmm. Is there an evolutionary benefit or is it just something that happens because of the molecules they're made out of? They examined a whole bunch of specimens from a museum collection using UV light. They would examine these taxidermied specimens and specimens in the collection, both preserved and non-preserved. So using preservatives on the right, specimen right. and then just, uh, and just... Just some fur. Just some fur. <laughs> and then they used fluorescent spectroscopy at three different ex- excitation wavelengths to make sure that it is biofluorescence and wasn't just reflected, that they weren't just seeing just a trick of the eye sort of thing. sure. sure. As they put it, it, whether it was fluorescence or optical scatter. And to try to determine if there's any effect by the preservation, you know, to make sure that we're not getting false signals because right. of if the If, like, the treatment. formaldehyde or yes. something is, is giving off light. If the chemical is fluorescing in a way that otherwise the animal wouldn't. They looked at tons of mammals and identified examples of, of biofluorescence in 125 species. Huh. Yep. Representing all 27 living mammalian orders, 
found it across 79 families, which is about half of mammalian families, in almost every clade of mammal. So this is just a mammal thing. Yeah. Mammals are glowing all over the place under UV. It was found in a variety of tissues, white and light fur, quills, whiskers, claws, teeth, and some naked skin. Hmm. They admitted things from green, blue, pink, or white under UV light. And included things like the inside of a red fox's ears glowed green. So the tuft of fur inside the ear glowed, not the rest. Sure. Polar bears, as they put it, lit up like a white (laughs) t-shirt under a black light. Just bright white all over. Zebra's white stripes also glowed, but not the black bark. Interesting. The leopard's yellow fur glowed. On the wings of the orange leaf-nosed bat, there was a glow on the skeleton. Uh, Like over the fingers and Mm -hmm. and arm bones? That was Mm. white, but the fur glowed pink. Hmm. Yeah. The only mammal that I noted that didn't have any external fluorescence that they looked at was the dwarf spinner dolphin, whose teeth did fluoresce. Oh, weird. Mm Mm-hmm. So just a big glowing smile. Oh, yeah. And when they used the spectroscopy to... Confirm this is true biofluorescence and not just some side effect. Many matched up with being legitimate biofluorescence. Uh, they didn't list if there were ones that seemed to maybe not be, but that th- this does seem to be a case of quite widespread true biofluorescence. And it was most common and intense in nocturnal species and terrestrial, arboreal, and fossorial animals where either more of their body was being fluorescent or more brightly fluorescent. So this establishes that it's very common among mammals, but still gives us very little info about what it's doing. It, it feels it's so common mm-hmm. that paradoxically it makes me wonder if it isn't a functional thing. Yes. If it's ju- it just happens to be the, the things that mammals are made of happen to fluoresce. They made a note that it seems to be a ubiquitous property just across the board of unpigmented fur and skin. Yeah. And one of those reasons is keratin fluoresces. Right. Keratin is a fluorescent molecule just by its nature, by its structure, it fluoresces under UV. Mm -hmm. So any structure in a mammal body that has keratin, which is a bunch of the mammal body, claws and hair and skin all have keratin, you have the potential for fluorescence just because of its presence this doesn't mean there couldn't still be a function it could still be for some form of signaling or to make them more noticeable to others of their kind but it also could just be a physical side effect of the structure of the molecules in their body yeah it's fun to have a study like this where it's oh there's this cool feature let's see how common it is and and widespread and see if we can sort of link that to a function and then to find it's so common that maybe maybe there's not actually it, too common for a function to make sense. Yes. Although you did say that they noted certain habits, certain habitats, certain parts of the body maybe more commonly fluorescing. Mm-hmm. So there may be, it, it could be something that is just sort of a natural side effect of just having fur or mm-hmm. being a mammal. And then some groups have actually evolved certain patterns and uses for it. Absolutely. There are some examples that seem to kind of lean both ways. Mm -hmm. One for something that could sync it up with habitat usage that's not having to do with the glowing. The southern marsupial mole is one of the most fluorescent mammals they found. Glowed very brightly because it has the yellow-white fur all over its body, but it's a subterranean animal, so typically it wouldn't be glowing. Because right, it, no one's seeing. Yeah, well, and it needs to be exposed to UV. Oh, yeah, that too. So it can't even, like, produce it like bioluminescence. It has to be in light to glow itself, and it is underground. Yep. It's likely, though, that the higher amounts of keratin in its fur to protect it from the abrasion of digging, mm-hmm. of being underground, is why it glows more. So right. there could be could, a... Could just be a side effect of that structure. Yes, there could be a sync up with fluorescence, not because you're glowing for a reason, but you have more keratin in certain spots or in certain situations for a reason. Yeah. I would like to propose the alternative hypothesis of marsupial mole underground secret raves. Right? Absolutely. We just haven't found those yet. Uh, so yeah, it's it seems like there's definitely some that don't make sense. Like the fact that the bat mostly uses echolocation to navigate... 
Mm -hmm. but glows in a complicated way. Sure. But then you have others that seem to be counter shaded, like the platypus right. and stuff. So it's it definitely is still a, a mostly a mystery as to what all this glowing is for, if it is for anything. But it turns out tons of very different mammals glow. That is very exciting. Yeah. Now and now we when we see a mammal, we get to wonder uh, what does your glow look like, right? Well, my first bit of news has nothing to do with anything that you just said, but it is about snakes. Uh, which means that it's better than whatever your news just was. Even more exciting, not only is it about snakes, it is about a first for the fossil record of snakes. In particular, trace fossils. Oh. For snakes. Snake footprints. Snake footprints. <laughs> <laughs> this is research by Charles Helm et al., published in the journal Ichnos. And in the blog post, we will link to an article uh, in the conversation written by two of the authors, Charles Helm and Haley Cothra. Snake tracks are not known from the fossil record. Which isn't too surprising. <laughs> at all, essentially. <laughs> uh, snakes do leave tracks behind. Mm -hmm. So uh, snakes can leave distinctive tracks in the sediment. Snakes move in distinctive ways. So if they're crawling or slithering or sidewinding over sand or mud or something that they can disturb, they can leave trackways. This has been observed a bunch in modern snakes, yes. observing the way that they disturb their sediment. But in the fossil record, there are, according to this paper, a handful of known traces that some of which seem to have been made by snake-like things. Okay, yeah. But probably not snake. Like, there's one from the Permian. Right there. <laughs> well, that's not a snake. That's too early. <laughs> but perhaps an amphibian that was moving like snakes. Others that are like burrows or undulating traces that could be snakes, but they could also be some other stuff. Yep, yep. To the effect that, so far, no actually known trace fossils of snakes in the fossil record. Why this is could be a handful of things. It could be that those tracks just don't survive very well. Yeah. That maybe they're really shallow or whatever reason. It could also be that we just don't know what to look for. Yes. That paleontologists just aren't very familiar with those. And so if we do see something, it might just not stand out. This study reports, based on their analysis, the first definite snake trace fossil ever. <laughs> this comes from the Cape South Coast of Africa, which is a region that is famous for trace fossils, yes. including a bunch of other reptiles. Uh, they actually did list, there's a bunch of sites down there with traces of things like crocodilians, tortoises, sea turtles, nice. like coming up and or going back to the water. This study describes uh, specifically the sort of the, the centerpiece of the study is a comes from a slab of rock that is a preserved dune. So it's called an aeolianite, which is windswept sediment. So a sand dune, basically. Dating to between 93 to 83,000 years ago. So okay. Pleistocene. The track was noted first, it seems, because there are four footprints on it of a bovid. <laughs> which these authors identify as most likely longhorned buffalo. Nice. Walking across. But also there is a long furrow across this slab of rock. And in fact, one of the bovid footprints steps on this furrow. <laughs> the furrow is about three meters long, uh, ranges, uh, depending on where it is, between six and nine centimeters wide. It is mostly straight, slightly sinuous in places, and at parts of its length has a groove running down the middle of it. This is what the authors have identified as a snake trace fossil. Mm -hmm. Specifically, a fossil left, a trace left behind by what is called rectilinear motion. So snakes move in a number of different ways. They can slither, right, that undulatory pattern back and forth. They can do weird stuff like sidewinding, yep, like yep. hopping across the sand. But they can also just kind of scooch in a straight line forward by moving their belly muscles. Yep. And just kind of inch, you scooch themselves across the ground. That groove down the center of the furrow matches what is seen in modern snakes, and it is left by the tip of the tail. Yep, yep. Uh, and it's often discontinuous because sometimes the tip will be raised up and sometimes it'll drag through the sand or whatnot. And so it's got this tail groove down the middle. And based on 
where it is and what snakes are known from this region during this time and the size of it, the authors suggest that it is most likely left by a snake of the right size that commonly uses this kind of locomotion, uh, which in this case they, they point to puff adder. Okay, okay. And they say this is probably puff adder or something similar to puff adder. That makes it cool. Yeah, when you said that many centimeters across, I was like, that's... It's a wide snake. That's a wide snake. And, it, and, and puff adders are thick snakes. Yes. And so my brain had initially gone to some sort of big constrictor, and I was like, mm -hmm. what, would they be moving around the desert? That's weird. And then, yeah, no, but puff adders, those are uh, uh, very pyramidal yes. <laughs> snakes. Uh, and this, I think, I believe this is shoreline. Mm -hmm. uh, so dunes. Yeah, yep, yep. The authors identify this trace as a new Ichno genus and Ichno species, Anguinichnus linearis. Also in this paper, they report three other sites with possible snake traces. Mm. Uh, traces that are reminiscent of slithering, right? That undulatory back and forth motion. And at least one that looks like it might be sidewinding. Cool. Uh, which also leaves a very distinctive track. They discuss all of these in the paper, and their conclusion is that they could be snakes, but we're not confident enough to say for sure that's what those are. Yeah. If they are, uh, number one, that can point us in the direction of looking for more complete examples. Also, though, uh, sidewinding, they said if the sidewinding tracks are, in fact, snake sidewinding, That'd be cool because there are no snakes known in that region today that do that. Yeah. So that would mean that there was a sidewinding snake there uh, where there isn't today. But having one example of uh, what they consider to be a quite confident crawling snake trace not only starts the fossil record of snake trace fossils, mm -hmm. which is pretty darn cool, but also starts establishing precedent examples that we can now use to then try to look for other similar traces in the fossil record. Yeah, it is very cool when we find you know, a, a new a, a, tra a new kind of trace fossil or new trace fossil for a group that we hadn't before, just because as, as has come up in previous discussions of trace fossils, this is actually the evidence of the animal doing something mm -hmm. not just the dead body you know which is super informative in all sorts of ways but you don't know what it did or does because it's dead this is actually that snake moved across and it moved in this way mm -hmm. and that's very cool i will be very interested to see if we are now able to find more because we have something to look for or if it turns out that this was a very one out of a million chance mm -hmm. that we got this fossil. You know, are they as rare as we suspected they might be? Right. Or are we just not looking yeah. for them? I, it'll be interesting to see if this if this changes the pattern or if it goes, nope, they're still not showing up. Yeah. You know, this seems like it is a very special fossil that we found it. And from what I read in the paper, it sounds like there is the potential for even more identifiable features they mentioned that sometimes with modern snakes, when they do crawl through the sand, you can get little grooves left by the scales. I was wondering if you get a scale pattern. On the belly, especially since that's what they're using in this straight line rectilinear motion. That's what they're using to scooch forward. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't sound like they saw that in this particular fossil, but there could be even more diagnostic features of snake tracks. Very cool. So keep looking around South Africa. <laughs> uh, and find all the snake tracks. Absolutely. My next news also has to do with trackways. All right. Uh, but these aren't left in sediment. These are left in leaves. Mm -hmm. This is re a report of the earliest evidence of leaf mining. Oh. Mm-hmm. This is research by Richard Necht et al. in New Phytologist. And the article is a press release by Harvard University and phys.org. So insects... Uh, typically don't fossilize well. They're very fragile. You know, we'll get impressions, we'll get wings and bits and pieces, but we don't usually get the whole insect. So trace fossils become a big part of learning about their behavior and their evolution. And one of those kinds of traces is feeding behavior, which is one of the more common since they chew on stuff very commonly. Yeah, they, they leave feeding traces often more recognizably than they would leave footprints. Exactly. And... Endophytic 
feeding where they're feeding inside the plant. Yeah, inside the leaf tissue. Mm-hmm. Or inside the stem. Mm-hmm. So any form where they are burrowing into the plant to feed. This could be boring. This could be galls. Yep. Uh, leaf mining and invading seeds all include all, all are included within this and have been observed in the fossil record quite a ways back, as early as the Devonian, both in plant and fungal tissues. Cool. Uh, That got a shout out in our herbivores episode 173. Yes, indeed. Some of these, though, are much better documented than others. Galling, for instance, has evidence going back to the Carboniferous uh, around 300 million years ago. Leaf mining is much less well documented. We don't have as many fossils, and the earliest fossils we have go back to the Triassic, uh, the early Triassic, so 250 million years ago. So there has been some particular interest in trying to learn more about leaf mining, especially since today it is only done by the holometabolous insects, which are your fully metamorphizing insects. Yeah, we talked about that in our uh, Evolution of Insects episode back in episode 99. Yep, yep. So this includes your moths and butterflies, your beetles, your flies, and wasps and sawflies. Their larva, some of their larva, you know, not all of them, but members of those four groups, which are incredibly diverse groups of insects, some of their larva will burrow into leaves and eat the tissue between the top and bottom layer of the leaf. Yes. So within the leaf itself, which is very small, but big enough for them to actually make a home and they will leave trails inside the leaf and they will leave behind droppings called frass which is one of the ways that often they will identify leaf mining is the presence of frass Mm. and some features can even help let you identify who made it yes then they'll pupate and cut their way out and leave as an adult so it's been of interest because this is the only group known to do it and there's seemingly a long pause between the earliest forms of invasive plant eating and this form so there's always been a question as to why the delay this new fossil uh, closes that gap up quite a bit because it is the earliest discovery of leaf mining in a seed fern leaf dating back to the middle carboniferous 312 million years ago that closes that gap up quite a bit oh yeah yeah <laughs> this is a major this about is almost 100 million years well uh, over 50 million yes. years they said <laughs> 70 million years <laughs> earlier than they had suspected before very cool that's a huge leap back this is from uh the rhode island formation of massachusetts which uh for us united statesians is a very confusing statement right uh, like the california <laughs> university of pennsylvania i had the same moment while i was reading it because I, ha- I had copy and pasted it and went wait what did yep. i say that right it's in one of those states <laughs> which originally was a swampy and uh wet environment and provides very good fossilization quality it's a lager stat- excellent uh and so they have these nicely preserved leaves no insects in them mm-hmm. just the traces of leaf mining inside yeah these are not identical to leaf mining traces that we are seeing in other other examples. They said it lacks the full features of Mesozoic leaf mines. So it doesn't have everything the same, mm-hmm. but it does have a lot of the characteristic things. So it's still very informative for how this behavior might have originated or at least some of its earlier evolution. And it does have some of, they said it has the key things that they use to identify this, which is a meandering trail and that the larva avoids the leaf's edges and major veins. All right. So it, the larva was still mining in big picture wise, the same way we see leaf miners now. Right. But not in all of the more specific features, it sounds like. Which makes sense. Yes. It's an earlier species doing this. Precisely. They also say that this gives some implications for holometabolous insects. Mm-hmm. That since that's the only group... Now, I say only group, but that is a huge portion of insects. Like, that's... Sure. But, but it does leave out some of the earlier branches. Exactly. Of like, the things like grasshoppers and dragonflies and stuff like that. Yes, it still leaves out some major other groups. And since it's the only one we know that does this, this does suggest that this type of... This group was already established and full metamorphosis was likely present by this time. Yeah. Unless there was some other leaf mining group that showed up and then went away right which there could be there absolutely could be but, but this is this it, it contributes to that picture the the similarities and the fact that it's so well known within this group suggest that 
we have some maybe insights into the evolution of that group as well yeah based off of this so often when dealing with the fossil record we are faced with the question of is this thing missing from the fossil record because it didn't exist or one of the other reasons. Yeah, or is it missing? <laughs> or do we, have we just not found it Yes, yet? is it, is, is it uh, AWOL? We're yes, trying to look it, for it. Or does it not fossilize? Mm-hmm. And so it's always really fun. Well, especially in a case like this where we're like, we know insects were boring through plants as early as X, but for some reason they don't show up doing it in leaves until way, way later. That doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah, that's weird. What's What's the story there? And uh, in this case, it is the simplest answer, which is that, yeah, uh, you, yes, you were correct. That doesn't make sense. We just hadn't found it yet. Yep. Which is very intriguing. And once again, has that moment of like, oh, man, have we been missing it? Or is this just a really hard thing to find? Right. Because it needs to be really good conditions like this fossil site. Yeah. And now like the snake tracks, maybe now we know to keep an eye out for it more than before. Yeah. Well, what, since we're on a roll with... Trace fossils. <laughs> My life, the last bit of news we got here is also trace fossils. Also a first for Ooh. a group of animals. Now, I'm not quite as excited about this one as the last one, because the last one was snakes, which are the best trace fossils. But I'm sure many of our listeners will be very excited. Uh, and it is very exciting. This is research that reports the first known footprints from terror birds. Oh, nice. This is research by Ricardo Melkor et al. in Scientific Reports, and we will link to an article in Sci News by Natalie Anderson. Terror birds. We talked about terror birds a bit in our More Birds episode. That was (laughs) 37.5. This is a group, uh, the family Forest Rackaday, which were predatory flightless birds Uh, mainly known from uh, the Cenozoic of South America. So the last several 10 millions of years, these were about 20 known species of birds, somewhat similar to modern-day Sariemas, which are also birds that hunt on the ground and are thought to be closely related to the terror birds. Terror birds ranged from one meter tall, which is pretty tall for a hunting flightless bird. No, that that would surprise you if you... Just came across that bird. Up to at least two meters tall. And that might be it for you if you come across that bird. (laughs) That's an ostrich-sized bird, uh, but uh, with a slicing beak for hunting. (laughs) Uh, Many of them are considered to be running hunters, like Mm -hmm. chasing after prey. Some of them, I think, are considered like waders, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. walking in shallow water. Which makes a lot of sense. Terror birds uh, are known from all different parts of the body, including the feet. Yeah. The feet aren't extremely well known, but we do know that like many birds, they had three main digits, uh, three main toes and a small extra raised digit. Kind of it, like maybe probably like a little dew claw kind yeah. of thing. Notably among terror birds, the inner of those three main digits, which is technically digit number two, but the inner of the three digits has a long curved claw on it. Yeah. Somewhat similar to what we see in Sariemas and certain other modern birds. Of course, uh, reminiscent of what we see in certain Dromaeosaurs, like yep. Velociraptor and Deinonychus, although it's not quite that extreme. Yes. Uh, the toe doesn't like curl back the same way that we see in those dinosaurs. But this kind of toe is thought that that big claw is thought to be potentially good for pinning prey or stabbing at stuff. Again, Sariemas have that same sort of big claw, and they will use it in similar ways. A lot of our predatory birds today have a enlarged inner claw. Yes. That seems to be good for gripping. Episode 163, <laughs> claws. However, how terror birds actually used their feet is not very well known, in part because we don't have excellent preservation of the feet in most cases, but also there are no known footprints which is much more surprising than the snake was. Yes. This one doesn't make any sense. <laughs> the snake, I get it. Yeah, well, because like a snake, <laughs> you're s- dispersing your entire weight evenly. So you're not leaving deep, deep, deep impressions. Sure. And even if you are, it's like a line in yeah. the sand. I, I, yeah, that's easy to overlook or get disturbed. But like not these, only these are, have feet. Yeah. And like not only are feet putting more pressure on a smaller place, you've only got two. Like you're putting right. all of your weight on only two <laughs> spots, not four. You should be leaving really good footprints. This study reports the first ever footprints identified as belonging to a terror bird. 
These come from the Rio Negro formation of Argentina. They are late Miocene, almost 8 million years old. They report a straight trackway of 17 consecutive footprints. Not bad. Which is real good. And 11 of them, according to the, the write-up, are well-preserved. Cool. So 11 nice footprints in a straight trackway. They are alongside ripples and mud cracks that suggest this was walking along a lake shore or something similar. The footprints belong to something large and bipedal. <laughs> and large and bipedal lines up generally with a handful of birds from that time that are known from this area, including Sariemas, including certain members of the Ratites. Uh, I think Rias or something closely related to Rias. But comparison with known fossil foot bones and tracks of those other groups led the authors to conclude that these don't match those other bird groups, but they do seem to be a good match for what we know of the feet of forest raccoons. Cool. Terror birds. They named another new ichnogenus and ichnospecies, Rio Negrina pososaladensis. They estimate based on the, I assume, the size of the footprints, but maybe also the depth of them, <laughs> that the track maker would have weighed about 55 kilograms or 120 pounds. Not bad. Which is a big bird. That's, that's a hefty bird. <laughs> and the thing that really stands out, terror bird feet have three toes, but the footprints predominantly have two. What? The terror bird seems to have been walking mainly on the middle and outer toe, leaving only shallow impressions hinting at the inner toe. Whoa. The middle toe impression is very deep and relatively thick, which suggests that it was the main support. Which is like, makes sense because like with ostriches, that's yep. basically the only toe they're running on. Yes, the second toe. So ostriches have two feet, two toes yep. on their feet. They have one toe that's really the toe. And then they have a second one that's kind of a stabilizer. Yes. This, these footprints, the outer toe on each foot seems to be doing that. It's kind of a stabilizer. It's a shallower impression, but it is still there. The inner toe print is very shallow, which seems to indicate that they weren't really using that inner toe for locomotion very much. Yeah. This is interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one, as you just alluded to ostriches, this kind of pattern of toe usage is associated with running habits oh, in yeah. a lot of animals. First of all, reducing down to one main toe as your uh, walking instrument. We see that a bunch. Horses famously have done that. Yep. Ostriches do that. A lot of dinosaurs do something very similar where they're kind of concentrating all of the weight support on one central toe. Yeah, just simplifying your running apparatus for fast and in a straight line. Yes. Ostriches have two toes and they walk very similar, like we said. Also, apparently, according to the paper, emus are known. Emus do have three toes mm -hmm. and they are known to when they go from walking to running. While running, they're mainly using two toes. Okay. While walking, they're putting all three down. But when they switch to running... They're mostly just using two. So this does seem to be a consistent feature of running flightless birds. Oh, that's fascinating. Very cool. And then, of course, there is the question of then if you're not using that toe very much for walking, what are you using that toe for? <laughs> now, when I read and it said uh, this terror bird seems to have been mainly walking on two of its three toes, the very first thought that came to my mind is the other group of theropods that we know that did that, which are your velociraptors and deinonychuses and stuff, which could raise that toe up. It actually curled back to keep that claw up off the ground. That's probably not what's happening here. Terror bird toes aren't shaped that way. Yes. But they could still be distributing their weight or raising the toe ever so slightly yeah. to keep it off the ground. And instead, that toe is being used for pinning prey or stabbing, as it has been suggested based on other birds like Sariemas. Very, man, now I, I want us to find a really well-preserved or more well-preserved feat for this group to see, like, was that one, are its joints notably different from the other toes? Yeah. Was it better at curling in for, like, gripping, you know, and not for support? That's 
awesome. That's so cool. Yeah, what a cool thing to know. I I love it when we find the first of something and we go, hey, this is the first one, which would be cool enough. But also, uh, it, it, there was, there's a thing here that we didn't know. Yeah, we didn't expect Western. this. <laughs> it's like when it, it, it feels akin to when we're like, hey, uh, we found a dinosaur with its uh, skin and stuff beautifully preserved in uh, the sediment, uh, which is all. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Right. Also feathers. Yes. Yeah. It's covered in feathers or there's color in it. Like mm-hmm. this would have been cool just being the first terror bird tracks. But uh, there's a whole bunch of extra stuff now to wonder about. Well, and it's it's also so nice because it it connects them with predatory birds in a very interesting and cool way mm-hmm. and other running bird like Yes, it's very cool. The features that this has because it they make sense. They just have ne- I've never heard them suggested or discussed for the group before because we didn't know to. And now that they're there, it's like yeah, that actually lines up in a lot of really interesting and and logical ways. Yeah, and we said these seem to be running adapted predatory birds. And then we get footprints and they go, oh, yeah, those look like running adapted yeah. predatory birds. Yeah, you would look like that, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, speaking of bird feet. All right. All right. See, see I'll give it to you. Yeah, not, yeah. not too bad. Yeah. Uh, if you don't get that joke yet, you're going to get it right <laughs> after the break. Uh, we are going to move on to our main discussion about hadrosaurs and other ornithopods. After this interlude, I will start by reminding you of who the hadrosaurs and ornithopods are. Stay tuned. What would you say is your favorite hadrosaur? Ooh, that is very... Parasaurolophus is very hard to beat. It's 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 a good one. But I think my favorite has always been Corythosaurus. Mm-hmm. Because my brother's name is Cory. Yeah. And when I was little and I found that out, I was like, look, 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 look it's your dinosaur. It's you. You're a dinosaur in here. <laughs> and so that one's always been in my head as like the... When, when they come up, I'm like, also this one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I have a favorite. Parasaurolophus comes to mind because it is just a classic dinosaur. It's it's the superstar, like, one of them. Absolutely. Uh, also, the other name that comes to mind is Myasaura. Yes. Uh, and I had a book about Myasaura. I also had one about Parasaurol. Those were, like, the two. Hmm. So there's a bunch of that. So I, I think of Parasaurolophus and Myasaura. They're very, a lot of them are very charming Very recognizable, very famous dinosaurs. Indeed. Hadrosaurs are the group of dinosaurs that are commonly called duckbill dinosaurs. Ducky! Uh, These include the ducky. (laughs) They include all the ones we just mentioned. Parasaurolophus with its expansive head crest in the back. Corythosaurus had like a helmet head. Yeah. Myasaurus, Edmontosaurus, Hadrosaurus itself. This episode is called Hadrosaurs. But we're cheating a little bit. This is uh, secretly, sneakily, an ornithopods episode. Yeah. Hadrosaurs are part of a broader group of dinosaurs called ornithopods. And when we expand it, that means we also include dinosaurs like Iguanodon and Hypsilophodon and a bunch of these kind of uh, almost generic herbivorous dinosaurs. In my head, and this might be kind of a weird comparison, but they they fit into a similar box. I always kind of think of them like the bovids or cervids, the cows or the deer of the dinosaur world. Like if you think herbivore, so all yeah. of these dinosaurs, they're plant eaters, they're herbivores. They are often quadrupedal and or bipedal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, they're often depicted as being able to do both. They're also often depicted living in herds. Mm-hmm. They kind of do fall into that category of like, like today, if you think a bunch of herbivores, the sort of classic image, most parts of the world is going to be something like a deer or a sheep or an antelope or something like that. The the pecorns. Yes. (laughs) Now, interestingly, something that distinguishes hadrosaurs from our sort of typical thought of deer and stuff today and also distinguishes them from other dinosaurs is that they are the one major group that doesn't have a thing. Yeah. Like all the other, like we've done all these other dinosaur groups. Stegosaurs are the plated dinosaurs and ankylosaurs are the armored dinosaurs 
and pachycephalosaurs have dome heads, and ceratopsians have horns and frills, and sauropods are big with long necks and long tails. Hadrosaur, most hadrosaurs are just kind of... Hadrosaurs. Hadrosaurs. <laughs> like, they don't have that, like, defining feature like so many of these other groups do, yeah. which I think is why part of why they feel like almost a generic version of herbivore dinosaurs. Absolutely. It's like, it is not at all accurate to say, like, they're the base model no but it does kind of get that energy when you don't have some obvious iconic thing yeah now we will go into plenty of detail in this episode dispelling the idea <laughs> that there's nothing special about ornithopods disagreeing with everything we just said yeah they are <laughs> extremely interesting fascinating dinosaurs they're really cool i i love them that like this is actually has a lot of my my favorite dinosaur features in this group yeah we're gonna get into a whole bunch Real quick, before we get into some more details on what they are like, let's place ourselves within the dinosaur family tree. As we have mentioned on every other dinosaur episode <laughs> that we have done, traditionally, Dinosauria is split into two main lineages. Sauricia, which has your theropods, your Tyrannosaurus-type dinosaurs, and your sauropods, your Brachiosaurus-type dinosaurs. And the other side are Ornithischians, the major groups of which are plated and armored dinosaurs, stegosaurs and ankylosaurs, and then two closer related groups, marginocephalians, the pachycephalosaurs, which are dome heads, and the horned dinosaurs, and then closely related to them, ornithopods. Yeah. So these are ornithischians. Their closest relatives are those ornamented head dinosaurs, uh, the dome heads, a lot of very spiky relatives. <laughs> yes, yeah, they have a lot of spiky relatives for animals that are not themselves very spiky. <laughs> well, they all, everyone else took all of them. They, yeah, they sure did. Ornithopods, including hadrosaurs, across the board, their body shape tends to be relatively similar. Uh, they often have large bodies, and even when they are relatively small, they, they're a bit bulkier, mm -hmm. like you think of herbivores often being. Big ones tend to have bigger tails. Their heads are not particularly large. They have long-ish necks, kind of like a lot of theropods, yeah, not long a, necks. A mobile neck. Like, they definitely yeah. can look around and get to stuff well. Their heads aren't all, always tiny, although on the big ones, they can be small compared to the body. Yeah, because the body gets real big. They're not, like, sauropod tiny, but they're also not huge, like, triceratops mm -hmm. and tyrannosaurus. Mm -hmm. Many of them are quadrupeds. Some of them are bipedal. Even in the quadrupeds, the hands, the front hands, tend to retain some grasping ability. That so they, they are still functional as hands, even when they're also using them to walk. A number of hadrosaurs, uh, some of whom we've already mentioned, are also famous. This is their thing. Mm -hmm. When we said they don't have a thing, some people out there were like, wait, but actually, some hadrosaurs have... Wacky head crests. Yeah. Just ornate, bony crests coming off of the skull. We will talk more about those later on. Mm -hmm. Ornithopods range a variety of sizes. The smallest ornithopods are quite small. Among the smallest ornithischian dinosaurs, uh, these are, you know, a few feet long. Aww. Uh, really little, really little guys. Many of them, especially more derived ornithopods, including hadrosaurs, can get quite large. Yes. Uh, several meters long. A lot of the famous ones, like Parasaurolophus and Edmontosaurus and Iguanodon, get into the 10 meters long range. So over 30 feet, on par with a lot of famous horned dinosaurs, armored dinosaurs, kind of like the classic big dinosaur size. Yes. However, the Biggest ornithopods, who I'll shout out here, include some truly large animals. Uh, I'll name two that often come up if you search giant ornithopods. Magnapolia laticotus from the late Cretaceous of Baja. Full-size estimate, 12 to 15 meters, between 40 and 50 feet, probably with a weight of at least several tons. Ugh. And then the famous one is Shantungosaurus. Shantungosaurus is a hadrosaur. They're both hadrosaurs. Shantungosaurus is from the late Cretaceous of China, known from multiple specimens, 
The full body size estimate ranges from 15 meters to 16 and a half meters, so over 50 feet long Ugh. at the upper range, with estimates of around 15 tons, <laughs> give or take. This is really interesting because that makes Shantungosaurus not only the largest known ornithopod, it is the largest known species of dinosaur that isn't a sauropod. Wow. This group has the biggest that dinosaurs ever got outside of sauropods, who, of course, are cheating. Yes. And win all the records because they're sauropods. Yep. And that's something I always forget. Like, like that, that'll that slip my mind very regularly when it comes to ornithopods and, and hadrosaurs specifically, because I typically think of them as big, but moderately big dinosaurs. Yeah, horse size. Yeah. yeah and maybe, maybe rhino size. Exactly. Like, they're big animals. I wouldn't want to... to try to push them around. Right. But they are, they are, according to many of the dino documentaries, to be eaten. <laughs> by, yes. So that they're eatable These size. are the snacks of the Cretaceous. Yeah. And then every now and then I'll come across ones and be like, oh, right, no, you're elephant yeah. size. You're big, big, big. These are elephant size, bigger. And then, yeah, Shantungosaurus, not only the largest not sauropod, but in that, like, if we're off by a couple of tons one way or the other, on par with the largest land mammals. Yes. Yep. In Drichotheres and big uh, elephants. If Shantungosaurus got a little bigger than we currently estimate it, they could be the largest land vertebrates, once again, besides sauropods. Yep. Sauropods are like, it's like when we talk about stuff, we have to go, the most blah on land. Yeah. Yep. Because the ocean already did everything. Exactly. Sauropods are the ocean of dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> A couple notes about names, because this is actually really important. And I think it's one of the ways, one of the reasons that hadrosaurs and ornithopods get a little bit of the short shrift, because the names we use for them are not always great names for them. <laughs> uh, the word ornithopod means bird foot. Yeah. They don't have very bird-like feet. Uh, they do have three toes, but they're not really like bird Feet. They don't. They also don't have that backward pointing toe. Yep. Yep. Also, early ornithopods have four toes. Yeah. So like eh, bird feet, they're not really bird feet. And I can see where some of the the leap in comparison, because I always sure. used to think of them as the plant eaters with theropod legs. Like yes. when I was they. That's how I categorize them. Is like all the other plant eaters, you know, or most of them that are four legged have like. Four leg looking legs. Right, they have column yeah, legs. Yeah, little like rhino kind, or, you know, uh, uh, elephant really is even better. Mm -hmm. Chunky legs. But then ornithopods and hadrosaurs and iguana have, you know, like very distinct toes. Yeah. And, and yeah. kind of an overall shape of like a T-Rex leg on the back. So that's how I thought of them. But they're not really the same. No, it actually is kind of notable that ornithopod body shape is somewhat similar to herbivorous theropods. Yes, it is. And in that sense, it is kind of the standard dinosaur shape. Yeah, yeah. Sort of. The other name that I want to address when talking about hadrosaurs is the name Duckbill. You may have noticed that we don't call them that on the podcast very often. No. Uh, and that I don't know about you. On my part, that is intentional. Yeah. Because the term duckbill is kind of a misnomer. The reason that these animals, especially hadrosaurs, got the name duckbill is because hadrosaurs tend to have this flattened, expanded front of the snout. Yes. Up front where the nostrils are, the bones of the skull flare outward in this kind of duckbill looking structure. A lot of artwork of these dinosaurs, especially earlier artwork, depicts them as having a duck-like bill. Yes. Uh, I remember the books that I had as a kid, like Myasaurus and Anatosaurus, would be depicted with this kind of ducky bill up front. Ducky has a ducky bill. Yep. In Land Before Time. This fit... Well, I, one of the reasons that I've seen suggested for why this took off is because in early, early paleontology, I'll, some of these were also suggested as waiters mm -hmm. spending time in the water, eating aquatic plants and stuff. This is once again, duckies, their group of dinosaurs was called the swimmers. Yes. And they're shown eating water plants. Yes. Both in that and in like Fantasia and stuff. This is not true uh, in two ways. Number one, we know that these were terrestrial animals. Mm -hmm. uh, they lived on land. We've got trackways. We've got all sorts of stuff. Also, they didn't have duck bills in life. They had a beak. 
we actually have some specimens that preserve evidence of the beak that was smacked onto the end of that duckbill-shaped skull. So there, there is a famous example of Edmontosaurus that has a natural mold of the keratinous beak that would have fit on the end of the skull. And it's like this squarish beak that hooks down in front of the mouth. That duckbill shape is in the bone. Yep. You wouldn't see that looking at them from outside. And different species had different. There were others that had pointier beaks versus broader beaks. So they wouldn't have been duckbilled. They yeah. would have been beaked. This is actually kind of a, a really beautiful example of the, the shrink wrapping term that comes up with paleo art. Right? Mm -hmm. Of we took the bone too literally yes. and just stayed to the outline of the bone. We didn't know otherwise. You know, we didn't have. Sure, yeah. In early days, we didn't know that no. stuff. But that is what led us down that wrong assumption because we just followed the shape of the bone. And if you had that shape, you look kind of like a duck. Yes. Now, with all that we've said about hadrosaurs and ornithopods broadly about the we're already knocking down misconceptions <laughs> and sort of the way that they kind of get overshadowed or misrepresented. Despite all of that, one of the things that makes ornithopods famous and hadrosaurs famous, uh, especially is that they are among the most diverse and successful of all herbivorous dinosaurs. In the Cretaceous, they are found on basically every landmass that we have access to, especially in northern continents. In many places, they are the most abundant dinosaurs in whatever fossil site you find. They have an incredibly rich fossil record, especially in places like here in North America, which means, so when we think of them as like, in terms of bison and antelope and deer, part of what does fit with that comparison is, yeah, they were everywhere. And that that's part of why they got, they get categorized that way in my brain is like, if you watch a documentary, it's all right, we're now on this part of this country. Cool. What hoofed mammal is here? Yes. So, all right. We're now in this other part of the world, completely different climate, completely different environment. What hoof mammal is here? Yes. Because there's going to be one. <laughs> in the late Cretaceous, hadrosaurs were like that. And even earlier than that, ornithopods were often like that. This means not only were they super successful, we actually have a ton of information about these dinosaurs. Yeah. Because they have a very extensive fossil record. I'm not going to talk about that yet. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. You First, tease. I'm teasing. There's going to be all sorts of cool stuff on the back end of this episode. <laughs> Before we get in to more of those details, let's take a tour, like we like to do, through the evolutionary history of ornithopods. As we've discussed before, dinosaurs proper get their start in the Triassic. Ornithopods seem to get their start in the Jurassic sometime. Most of them, they reach their sort of expansive diversity in the Cretaceous, and then especially in the later Cretaceous, although there are early members that are known from the Jurassic. For the purposes of breaking down ornithopod evolution, I'm going to split them into three groups that we're going to sort of follow up the evolutionary chain. There are hadrosaurs, which are this very derived sort of later evolving group of ornithopods who belong to a larger group that are called iguanodontians. Yeah. And outside of that, there's this cluster that are basal ornithopods. Right. Early branching ornithopods. Uh, you will sometimes call her them just called hypsilophodonts. <laughs> Let's begin with these early branching groups within ornithopods. Before we get to some of the big famous ones later on, like Iguanodon and the Hadrosaurs, early ornithopods include a variety of small herbivorous dinosaurs who tend to be bipedal. They tend to have that early dinosaur body shape where they're running around on two legs, but they're, they have hands' hands. Yes. Early branching ornithopods are known, or non-iguanodontian ornithopods, <laughs> are known from the Jurassic through the Cretaceous. And here's the thing about this group. One of the things that makes these non-iguanodontian ornithopods sort of notable and famous is how much the classification within this group portion has changed over the years yeah there's been a ton of scientific back and forth trying to figure out where is actually the border of ornithopod and who gets in the group and who's outside of it early on like classically the the group ornithopoda 
included all Ornithischians that weren't Stegosaurs, Ankylosaurs, or Ceratopsians. Okay, wow. As time went on, various groups were removed, right? Pachycephalosaurs were placed, uh, were identified as being closely related to horned dinosaurs. A lot of bipedal early dinosaurs were identified as early members of other groups. Yeah, exactly. Ornithopoda has sort of shrunk over time. Uh, Heterodontosaurs were traditionally identified as ornithopods. Oh. They are not considered ornithopods these days. Neat. They are an earlier branch of ornithischian. Uh, within the last several years, studies continue to rearrange the groups within and just outside of proper ornithopods. Some of the groups that are these days often considered part of early ornithopods include uh, the most famous example, Hypsilophodon. Yep. Uh, this is an extremely famous dinosaur from uh, the early Cretaceous of Europe. These are a couple of meters long, not particularly large dinosaurs. These are the classic early ornithopod. Yeah. Like, this is kind of the go-to example for early ornithopods. Uh, some studies have found that there are other species within Hypsilophodontidae. Uh, there it was a paper that came out last month Convenient. that identified a potential other member of the Hypsilophodontid family. There are also Jeholosaurids, which are another group of small herbivores from early Cretaceous China. Thessalosaurids, including Thessalosaurus. This is a group that are found in Asia and North America that got larger for early ornithopods, a few meters long. Whoa. You know, d now we're getting into proper like deer and yeah. antelope sized and or even bigger. Also, uh, often included within these groups are is Orodromenae, which is also a group of small herbivores, also found in Asia and North America. These are famous for including, for one, Erictodromius, which is, as far as I remember, the only dinosaur species thus far that has been discovered in burrows. Oh, right. And there are other members of this group that have powerful front arms mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that might have been diggers. Yeah. This has possibly digging ornithopods, which is pretty cool. They're diggers. So you've got a variety. You've got your orodromines and you've got thessalosaurids and hypsilophodontids and such. In recent write-ups that I have seen, those groups are included as early branching members of Ornithopoda. From what I've read, every one of those groups has, at least at one point, been classified outside of Ornithopods, <laughs> and most of them have been classified inside each other's groups <laughs> at various times. So the Orodromians are commonly, still to this day, often referred to as Thessalosaurids. So, so there's a whole lot of back and forth trying to decipher how do these early branches of ornithopods actually fit together? Uh, we don't know. We're yeah. working on it. Which, as as we often like to point out, is very common in the early lineages of a major group. Yes. Just because the features that now that become so defined in later lineages, later branches, are not yet as defined. So yes. It's a little more blurry to tell who's related to who, because you, you all share a lot more features than you don't. <laughs> yes. We also benefit in those cases from having early geologically mm -hmm. representatives of these groups. And the farther back in time you go, the harder it is to get good fossils. Yes. So it becomes confusing. However they are defined, these early members of ornithopods, like I said, bipedal, not really built for running. They're not like early theropods. You are your carnivorous dinosaurs are often adapted for speed yes these are not they don't they don't really have any major defensive structures to speak of they tend to have narrow beaks okay which suggests that they were often choosy eaters mm -hmm. so they were specialists perhaps in different types of plants yeah going in and nipping off the part or specific plant they wanted yes and since they're small they're probably eating on like ground cover plants this is sort of how the ornithopod group gets started. The, this is sort of the, the early version of ornithopods. From within this cluster of early ornithopod groups, there emerges a new group, Iguanodontia, as opposed to all those non-Iguanodontian ornithopods that we were just talking about. 
as this grew, as we move into Iguanodontians, we see the evolution of larger bodies, Mm -hmm. heavier bodies, and a lot of groups become quadrupeds. Yeah. They start spending, if not all of their time, most of their time on all fours. We also see them adapting their mouth parts. They develop a toothlessness in the front of the mouth. So they have a toothless beak. They get cl- these classic diamond shaped tooth crowns mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. are typical of later ornithopods. Their jaws become better adapted for moving and manipulating food. These are all trends that will continue over the course of Ornithopoda. The earliest Iguanodontians are known from the mid-Jurassic, and then they expand in the Cretaceous. These include some famous examples like Camptosaurus from the late Jurassic in North America, Tenontosaurus, a very famous example uh, from here in North America in the early Cretaceous. That's the one that is presumably getting hunted by Deinonychus. <laughs> uh, there are Dryosaurids, a group that is known from several continents uh, from the Jurassic through the Cretaceous. And within these Iguanodontians, another subgroup called Styracosterna. You don't have to remember that one. There won't be a quiz on that one. (laughs) But this group starts to emphasize some of the features that become famous among Iguanodontians. They get bigger, now starting to reach several meters long. They also evolve a much larger nasal cavity. This is something we see in later ornithopods, just big nose, big nostrils. And... They evolve what Tom Holtz's dinosaur class notes described as the Swiss army hand. (laughs) That's great. The the front, the hands, so the feet are still the feet. The hands at the end of the forelimbs have five digits adapted for a variety of things. The first digit, that is the thumb, effectively, is a spike. Yep. Yep. This is the famous, you see this in like Iguanodon, that famous thumb spike. We don't know what they were doing with that. Presumably, uh, you know, enthusiastically consenting to things. Yeah, this is the the thing that caused all the early art of Iguanodon to give them the Fonzie thumbs. Yes. Uh, And I have seen art of them like jabbing the thumb into Mm -hmm. the neck of a Tyrannosaur or something. Well, and they use it in... Or an Allosaur, I guess. They use it in Disney's Dinosaur where they they like swipe it at each other when they're fighting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So the thumb in in these derived Iguanodontians, big spike. Digits two, three, and four, so the middle digits of the hand, are longer and more weight-bearing. Yeah. They are stronger to help them to be quadrupedal. The ungual, so the last bones in each of those digits, are hoof-like. Yeah. To support that weight. And then the last digit, the pinky, is opposable Mm -hmm -hmm. for grasping. So they have a hand that can support their weight while they walk, can grab onto stuff, presumably good for grabbing at branches and things, and then a a Fonzie thumb for some reason. Yep. This group includes Iguanodon. Uh, This is the this is the group is called Iguanodontia. Iguanodon from England, one of the three first named dinosaurs. Also includes Oranosaurus, which is uh, often depicted as being sail-backed mm-hmm. from early Cretaceous Africa. Langosaurus from the early Cretaceous of China, which is famous for its enormous teeth. <laughs> I don't have any more details about that, they, but they have enormous teeth. Big teeth. These Iguanodontians grow to large sizes, well-developed jaws and teeth. They become not only larger, but more specialized for eating Mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. eating lots of plants and thus as we move into the cretaceous these groups of larger ornithopods start to become really abundant and in many places as you move from the jurassic to the cretaceous as stegosaurs and sauropods dwindle in many places they are replaced by ornithopods iguanodontian ornithopods very cool also i thought when you were mentioning them uh, losing their front teeth. Uh, that's another similarity between them and a lot of hoofed yep. herbivores. It's a reduction of front teeth. We also see that in herbivorous theropods. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did talk about some of this in our herbivores episode, yeah. 173. Yeah, loss of the front teeth is a common thing that herbivores do. Yep, yep. In dinosaurs, that often is associated with developing a beak. Yes. Up front. Iguanodontians are sort of the peak 
of ornithopods in their time and in their places. But then as we move to the late Cretaceous, within Iguanodontia, a new group develops and rises to abundance, Hadrosauridae, the true Hadrosaurs. The evolution of Hadrosaurs comes along with major changes to the skull. The nostrils continue to get bigger, just their, <laughs> their noses are huge. We see that expanded, flattened end of the snout, that duckbill shape. They develop more teeth, more complex teeth. The further development of this dental battery, mm -hmm. just these rows and rows of locked, interlocked, stacked teeth, as they become even more specialized for herbivory, for being really good at eating plants. Also, hadrosaurs lose the thumb spike. Bomber. Uh, and indeed, the thumb. Yep. Uh, they reduce, th that digit goes away, so they have only some of the Swiss army hand. <laughs> still, still weight-bearing. Uh, still with the, the grasping. Well, that's uh, just the no multi tool, you know, less of a <laughs> Swiss right. Army knife. Listen, the thumbs up was so early Cretaceous. <laughs> they have another, they could still uh, presumably do like, uh, well, they could do some of the dog yeah, say, shadow puppet. It's a, it's a sh sh shadow puppet snake. <laughs> <laughs> Hadrosaurs develop two major subgroups. The Hadrosaurinae, which have extra ducky bills like that <laughs> flared uh, uh, snout once again just the bones yes but is extra flared giving them that wide upper part of the jaw extra big nostrils this group includes edmontosaurus myasaura shantungasaurus the the giant one the really really big one as well as hadrosaurus Woo! Hadrosaurus not only lends its name to the group, but in a similar vein to Iguanodon, a historically very important uh, dinosaur, Hadrosaurus fulcii, discovered in New Jersey, was the first dinosaur known in North America from more than just teeth. I don't know that I knew that. Yeah, this, it was the first dinosaur skeleton identified in North America. Well done, Hadrosaurus. The other half of the Hadrosauridae, uh, we have the Hadrosaurines as the Lambiosaurinae. Yeah. This group is famous for the fact that the bones in the front of the skull expand to form elaborate head crests. Yay. This is the group that has Parasaurolophus. It has Corythosaurus. It has Lambiosaurus, where it gets its name from. Also Magnapolia, the silver medal for giant ornithopods. <laughs> These two groups, hadrosaurs in their two major lineages in the late Cretaceous, become the most diverse and successful group of ornithopods. Yeah. A, gr a group of dinosaurs that was already quite diverse and successful. Hadrosaurs perfect the ornithopod. We've talked before about how one of the tragedies of the end Cretaceous extinction is that dinosaurs were actually doing really well. Yep. Uh, throughout the Cretaceous. It wasn't like they had been dwindling like trilobites and then vanished. The late Cretaceous was peak dinosaur in many regards. And every time I think peak dinosaur, one of the first examples that comes to my mind is hadrosaurs. Yeah. They really t took over late Cretaceous ecosystems. Well, and, and it it's so notable because if you just look up pictures of hadrosaurs, you'll see just insane diversity in how they look and then you find out just late late cretaceous like this wasn't happening throughout the mes those aren't spread across nope. the entire age of that's dinosaurs late cretaceous that all happened right there that's how well they were doing they yes. diversified that much and that quickly they are all over the world they are extremely abundant in many ecosystems they are highly successful and as we mentioned before that abundance that global distribution has left behind a surprisingly good fossil record that has allowed us to learn a surprisingly detailed amount of knowledge about these dinosaurs. So after the break, we will go into a bit more about what that looks like and what we know about these super cool dinos. Excellent. Thanks in part 
to their incredible abundance and success, ornithopods and hadrosaurs in particular have among the best fossil record of dinosaurs. Yeah. They are known from tons of articulated skeletons. Lots of full skeletons are known from hadrosaurs. Thousands of specimens. There are hadrosaur sites that are just bone beds (laughs) where we've got lots of specimens all in the same place. Some species of hadrosaurs are known from entire growth series. Yeah. Like egg, embryo, newborns, all the way up to elderly adults. We have the whole growth series for some species. Which is insane. Unprecedented among most groups of fossil life. There are also tons of examples of skin impressions, stomach contents, trackways. All of this means that hadrosaurs are often the first groups of dinosaurs that we get to try out certain methodologies on. We can study lifestyle and reproduction and behavior and such in hadrosaurs better than we can in most other dinosaurs. So they tend to be, this is the testing ground. Yeah, the guinea pig. We talked about this with uh, tyrannosaurs in episode 120, that T-Rex often serves this purpose, where it's Mm -hmm. like, yeah, you're the first one that's going to get some of these tests done, and then we can refine it and move on to other dinosaurs. A couple of examples, because they're fun to talk about. One of the most famous hadrosaur fossils in the world is a specimen of Brachylophosaurus named Leonardo, (laughs) which was discovered in 2000 in Montana. Leonardo is famous for skin impressions. Yeah. Leonardo's body, the skeleton, is preserved alongside and, you know, enclosed by fossil traces of the skin that covered the body. Skin impressions reportedly cover about 90% of the body. What? This has allowed us to examine the scale pattern. So, like, the shape and distribution of scales the soft tissue around the neck and head, including, if I remember right, there's like little little projections of soft tissue, like little long bristly scales on the neck. Cool. The shape of the beak on the snout. Also, Leonardo, I think is where we learned this, or at least you can see it, those walking digits, so the middle fingers on the hand, are united in what I saw described as a soft tissue mitten. Yeah. That they are all uh, together. Leonardo also has gut contents that tell us about the diets of these animals. This is an incredible specimen, and it is famous for being incredible in these specific ways. And it is only one example. There are several examples of hadrosaurs with skin impressions, with gut contents, uh, including other species besides Brachylophosaurus. So cool. The other famous example of what we are able to do with hadrosaurs, and the one that if you had asked me before I ever took any notes for this episode, if you said, give me an example of something of a cool thing discovery wise about hadrosaurs, I would have talked about Myasaur. Yep. And I would have missed stuff. Yes. Yeah. Myasaur is a hadrosaur known for, again from here in North America, Montana and Alberta, I believe. Myasaura became famous in the 1970s with the discovery of a nesting colony. Mm-hmm. Myasaura, these are big hadrosaurs. These are, you know, one of these, you know, several meter long hadrosaurs. A fossil deposit in Montana that preserved adults and young and eggs and nests with eggs and newborn fossils in the nests. Yeah. And we could see the spacing between the nests. That was enough for adults to be walking between the nests and and navigating to presumably go get food and bring it back to their young and stuff like that. This was the first time this had ever been found for dinosaurs. Yep. Uh, Hence, Myasaur's name is named the Good Mother Mm -hmm. Dinosaur. This is what Myasaur is famous for, is for nesting sites. Well, and and it's so pertinent because, and you know, this is like one of the main things that they like to come back to in Jurassic Park Lost World that earlier on we didn't we assume that they were like a lot of modern day reptiles and lizards where they, they lay eggs and then the eggs are on their own and yes. the babies have to fend for themselves and that they're just you know, cold hearted, not parental. And then we 
find this and go, oh, that's the opposite of that, all of that. That is not what that means. <laughs> yeah, that Myasaura kickstarted that. These days, Myasaura, uh, the, the genus, the species, is known from hundreds of specimens. And indeed, and this is the part I would have uh, neglected to mention, uh, left to my own devices, there was a 2015 study that did a population analysis <gasps> on Myasaura by taking a histology, so studying the internal structure of the bones, from 50 individuals, <laughs> which is a sample size that you would almost never get, uh, especially with dinosaurs, to be able to basically reconstruct the whole life history of my sort of samples of all of individuals of all different ages. And from this, they were able to determine such things as age at sexual maturity, huh. three years, age at full adult size, about eight years. Also, mortality rate at different life stages. <gasps> they determined from their sample that there was a mortality rate of 90% within the first year of life, uh, which is pretty, that's sad, but that is, that's how most, a lot of populations work. Babies are really not, they don't, do not have great survival sense. No. They, they don't, <laughs> they're, they're not, not very great. responsible. They have a terrible sense of judgment. Uh, mortality rate drops to about 12% between ages one and seven. Okay. So this is like their prime, the prime of life. Mm -hmm. And then once they reach eight years and up, mortality rate goes up again to 44%. At least those numbers are specifically their sample. Yes. This is an astonishing amount of information to know about any extinct species. Yeah. Like, no, this is how old they were when they reached sexual maturity. This is how many of the young you could expect to survive. Not like a projection where we're like, well, comparing to modern animals and thinking about... But, this is actual data from the animals. Like, yeah, one in 10 mm -hmm. of the young are liable to survive based on this data that we have. Wow. In an article about this study, uh, the lead, I believe the lead author, Holly Woodward, is quoted as saying, and I, I copy this quote over because it's great. We now know more about the life history of Myasaura than any other dinosaur, and we have the sample size to back up our conclusions our study makes Myasaura a model organism to which other dinosaur population biology studies will be compared. Yeah. This is another thing we mentioned in the Tyrannosaurs episode. You don't get to use the phrase model organism with fossils all that often and almost never with dinosaurs. Yep. With large vertebrate fossils. It's so impressive and it just really highlights how successful these dinosaurs like these dinosaurs were doing so well and there were so many places that if it was statistically possible for them to fossilize in a really unlikely way they were able to hit it and they give did. us 90 percent skin impression f specimens and entire nesting colonies yeah that's it those things are not likely to happen but when you've taken over the world at least one of your groups more likely to stumble into it yes <laughs> so we have all these amazing things it also helps that hadrosaurs and ornithopods broadly while they are known from all over the world they appear to have been most successful and diverse in northern continents mm -hmm. which is also historically where most paleontology has been has been done yes so like if you were very successful in North America, that's fantastic for paleontology because that's where most paleontology has happened. Yes. <laughs> over the year, like North America and Europe, that's that's what that's why all the famous examples I listed earlier, Iguanodon and Hypsilophodon and Hadrosaurus and all those are all Europe and North American dinosaurs. Yep. Because you early on, you can't be the first one. If you're the fifth continent yep. <laughs> that has been explored by this science. Yeah, if you're the last place I look. <laughs> yeah, I think you don't get to break a record. <laughs> Whoops. So that, they they were extremely diverse and also happened to be successful in the parts of the world that we started doing modern paleontology in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All this information has also allowed us to interpret something that is well known in dinosaurs in general, but a thing that hadrosaurs are particularly famous for which is social behavior yeah. these are highly social dinosaurs there are many examples uh again bone beds there are places where you get lots of individuals together including both young and adults there are many examples of trackways 
where we get their footprints showing multiple individuals moving seemingly across this landscape at the same time. In fact, I found one study that was examining hadrosaur trackways from New Mexico, uh, and there were various trackways uh, with footprints of varying sizes. So you had little hadrosaurs and big hadrosaurs, and they studied the pattern of the tracks and found that the stride, like the, the gait that they were using, was different for the big and the little ones. Now, in some sites, uh, we uh, it has been noted that young hadrosaurs, at least in some cases, seem to have been walking more on their hind feet. Yep, yep. Whereas the adults were walking more on all fours. But at this particular site, they also noted that the stride was different such that the young ones, the little ones, were walking relatively faster and the big ones were walking relatively slower so that ultimately they were moving the same speed. Yep, yep, yep. That the big ones were slowing down <laughs> to so the little ones could keep up and the little ones were speeding up to keep up with the big ones. The, the strides were different. The speeds were the same. Man, I just had a flashback to walking across campus in college with different heighted <laughs> friends yeah. complaining about not being able to fall in step together because then we would just slowly spread out. Yeah, which and that's like that's awesome. what an incredible demonstration of herd behavior. Yes, uh, you are at, you are lining up your movement speed. Like these these different size animals were all moving the same speed. Yes, and that's. That's fantastic. Which also goes hand in hand with signs of parental care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Like we said, we've got places like with Mayasora, where you've got nests with eggs, with newborns, with adult fossils, all in the same place. Also, uh, in at least uh, this, at least in Mayasora, and I think in at least some other hadrosaurs, it's been shown that the limbs of baby hadrosaurs aren't very well developed, so they might not have been able to move around very much. But in those same specimens, it has been noted in some cases that their teeth show signs of wear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they weren't able to move very much, but they were eating. Yep. Which is decent support that they were being fed. Yep. I remember a lot of the dino books I had as a kid, when it would get to the part about Myasaura, would have vegetation in the nest uh, or like show the mom dropping it in. Yes, I've seen I remember some image from somewhere of Myasaur regurgitating mm -hmm, food mm -hmm. like birds often do today. Yep, yep. Yeah, these were apparently very social, living in herds. Oh, this is one of I, I really it's ornithopods and sauropods are the two groups of dinosaurs. We all we talk about group behavior in dinosaurs so often that it's easy to forget that a lot of dinosaurs we don't actually have very strong evidence yes. for abundant group behavior. Because once again, that's a very specific set of evidence that you need to really be able to confirm that there were groups of these dinosaurs. Yes. Ornithopods and sauropods I, I have seen often cited as the two major groups where we're able to go, yeah, no, but, but these were herd animals. Yeah. These were... By and large, herding animals, which is even more impressive when you consider that they're also huge. Yeah. Just big herds of big animals is very impressive. Which definitely makes sense when you're also dealing with big predators. Like, yes, you got some big meaty predators out there. So even, even though you are scary big to our sense of animal nowadays... Yeah, yeah, probably still safety in numbers was a good idea. Oh, yeah. But the <laughs> hadrosaurs were there at their most successful and abundant in the late Cretaceous. And in fact, almost exclusively late Cretaceous. You know who else was a late Cretaceous group of dinosaurs? Tyrannosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of you were doing real well in North America. Yeah, that's that's where that is the domain of the king. <laughs> You're getting close to some big mouths. It's it also came to mind when you were mentioning earlier nithopods in that they don't seem built for running and don't seem to have major defensive attributes, mm -hmm. which is is a trait that continues throughout the group. And then your best defense is yeah. a group. Herds. Group together, and then you don't need to be spiky or scary or fast because you're a crowd. Yes. And a crowd can do a lot. Yes. And that I had that thought the same way as I was going through... And considering that, yeah, they didn't, that was their defense. Yes, exactly. Almost certainly would have been living in groups together. Which it is goes all the way back to when we were saying, like, they don't seem to really be the group that has a thing. It's because they were 
popular. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, <laughs> this, they perfected dinosaur. Yes. And all the others had to be like, oh, I guess I'll have horns. Yeah. I guess I better <laughs> arm myself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ceratopsians and ankylosaurs in the late Cretaceous were out there being like, listen, meat eaters keep bouncing off the herds of hadrosaurs. <laughs> we got to do something. We got to come up with something. <laughs> you guys want to hang out? No. Well, nuts. <laughs> yeah, I guess I got to evolve something. <laughs> Now, uh, hadrosaurs, of course, are known for uh, very many cool things. At the top of the episode, uh, I did mention that we would spend some time dispelling this notion that there wasn't anything in particular anatomically interesting about hadrosaurs. There are two features of hadrosaurs that I want to zero in on because they are two things that hadrosaurs did like the plates of stegosaurs, like the frills and horns of ceratopsians two major anatomical features that really set them apart. One of them is the obvious one we've already mentioned. That'll be next. <laughs> First, teeth. This is one of my favorite things about this group. The hadrosaurs uh, possibly were the best at teeth. Mm -hmm. They kind of perfected chewing. <laughs> Hadrosaur dentition, the, the, the assortment of teeth in the mouth, is extremely complex. I have seen it referenced many times as the most complex dentition, not only of dinosaurs, of vertebrates. Uh, of teeth that have been. <laughs> of te like teeth. Yep. Verte animals with teeth. Yep. Uh, and that, when, when you hear, when someone points at a reptile and goes, they had the best, they had the most complex teeth. There is like a primordial thing inside yep, of me. Mammalian. <laughs> inside of my mammalian heritage that goes... Wait, but no. <laughs> I beg your pardon. That's that's our thing. That's I've I was in the mammalogy class. Yeah. It's all we talked about was teeth. That, and we've talked about this on the podcast before. We did a teeth episode, mm -hmm. 88. Mammals, one of the things that mammals did really, really well, that sort of uniquely well in their evolution is teeth. Mm. Teeth for chewing and grinding. There are tons of examples within mammals of high, high specialization in teeth. For grinding, especially with herbivores, horses and cows and elephants and stuff like that. Highly specific, very specialized teeth to be the best that they can possibly be at grinding up plants. And like that fit together like puzzle pieces. They're so well refined. Yes. Hadrosaurs did it better than that. Which is insane. It sounds so insane. But then you see them up close yeah. and you go, OK, no, no, uh, I'm good. So let's talk about those. Uh, if you think of a dinosaur jaw, if you think of a you know, tyrannosaur sauropod or something, the classic setup of dinosaur dentition is a row of teeth, mm -hmm. like a crocodilian, like our teeth. Yeah. yeah. A row of teeth. Like crocodilians, uh, dinosaurs tended to have replacement teeth. So these are animals that as their teeth wear down over time, the top one pops out and then like stacked cones, there's another tooth ready to come up. Unlike mammals, who one of the trade-offs that we did was we got rid of that constant tooth replacement in favor of having really great teeth. Yep. Or we had, they're so great, we keep them around. Well, it's like it's uh, mass-produced versus handmade. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we quality over quantity. <laughs> uh, dinosaurs are constantly shedding and, produce and reproducing teeth. Hadrosaurs, and we see this develop more and more over the course of ornithopod evolution, hadrosaurs have... Many, many small teeth closely packed together into a structure called a dental battery. Which is a great term. I love that term. We use that term in the Ceratopsians episode, uh -huh. 87, because they also have a dental battery. There are fish that have dental batteries. Really what it means is that you've got a bunch of teeth closely packed together into like a mat of teeth. Yeah, like, like kind of a, a, almost a grid system. Not, not always perfect grid system, mm -hmm. but like cluster together like bricks in a wall yeah it's a cluster of teeth rather than just a simple row of teeth some hadrosaurs famously like edmontosaurus i've seen cited uh, with this can have up to 60 tooth positions hmm. per dentary so like left side of the lower jaw 60 tooth positions right side of the lower jaw 60 more tooth positions insane now I say tooth positions rather than teeth 
because they also have that stack of replacement teeth like other. So at any given time in a dinosaur's jaw, there tends to be more teeth than just the ones you can see. Exactly. Because there's like Crocs, yeah. there's a, a handful of replacements underneath waiting. Mm-hmm. Just uh, like to with come up. sharks have their rows of teeth, but they're not using all of those rows on you at once. Yes. And when they bite a fish, it's the front row doing the job. Usually the rest are waiting. Yes. Hadrosaurs also have two. So Edmontosaurus has five or six teeth at each of those 60 tooth positions just in a stack. Mm-hmm. But unlike other dinosaurs and hadrosaurs, the tooth stacks are angled such that multiple teeth in each tooth family, in each tooth stack, can be part of the grinding surface at the same time. Yeah, so instead of just using the top tooth, then tooth two, then tooth three, they're using one through six all at once or whatever or however many i don't actually i'm sure it varies (laughs) yes but yeah they're angled so that many multiple teeth in the same stack are part of that occlusal survey the the, Mm -hmm. the surface that is meeting other teeth and grinding up food also in addition to sort of messing with tooth the tooth replacement series in that way they don't replace their teeth the normal way, like other dinosaurs. As hadrosaur teeth develop, so uh, if you think of a tooth, you've got the outer sort of hard stuff and then the inner pulp cavity with all the nerves and tissue, uh, the soft tissue and stuff. Uh, there's more to it than that. Go listen to the teeth episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, hadrosaur, by the uh, incidentally, hadrosaur tooth tissue structure, super complicated. Yep. It, they've got, one part of the tooth is covered in enamel, like a normal tooth. The other part is covered in cementum, mm-hmm. which is the root tissue of a tooth. Yeah. Th- very strange. Yeah, they took all... It, it very much feels like they took all the ingredients of a tooth and went, all right, but do we have to put them in those spots every time? Right, let's move them around. Now, these all have different properties. And case in point, as a hadrosaur's tooth develops, the pulp cavity, which is where the soft stuff, the nerves and blood vessels and stuff go, becomes filled with dentin. <laughs> which is one of the hard parts of tooth. So eventually, by the time the tooth is like fully done, the pulp cavity is all hard tissue and it's no longer a living tooth. Yep. It's no longer getting blood vessels, nerves and stuff. It's effectively dead tissue. It's a dead tooth. And in most dinosaurs, it would pop off and the new tooth would come in. But in hadrosaurs, it just stays there as part of the battery, Mm -hmm. which means that instead of losing, shedding teeth and having them replaced, hadrosaurs could wear each tooth completely away. Yes. The pulp cavity becomes filled with dentin and as the tooth wears down, becomes part of the grinding surface (laughs) as the tooth wears down, which means that a functional hadrosaur dent like if you popped open the mouth of a hadrosaur an adult hadrosaur and looked inside the grinding surface that they are using to crush up their their food would include multiple generations of teeth at each position at varying stages of wear living teeth and dead teeth and the grinding surface is being contributed to by both the crown and and parts of the roots yep. of teeth. There is no other group of vertebrates that does this. Herbivore, the way that this is that this uh, was was phrased in the paper that I was reading about this, hadrosaurs functionalized the root of the tooth yep. for chewing. And then the tooth wears completely away. Yes, yeah. That's Just, when they lose the tooth. They're done using it when there's no tooth left. There is no tooth left. And it has just exposed the tooth underneath it to then start wearing. That's incredibly intense. It's so intense. It made me think of two things. One, hadrosaurs were definitely that kid in your class that you see doing their homework with like an inch long pencil. That's just the eraser. (laughs) And in the tip, they're like, no, it's still good. Except that it's a fistful of inch long pencils (laughs) all at the same time. No, I can can do my whole homework with this. This thing's still good. Also... It means that they responded to the tooth situation that instead of making then, you know, their individual teeth are very advanced for dinosaur teeth. Absolutely. But like instead of going the mammal route and just making individual teeth that are very, very complex, 
they went like the ant route and they're like, no, no, we can make a bunch of teeth. We're our group is really good at making bunches of teeth, but they're all going to work together to do very complex work. Yeah, they they turned their teeth into single uber teeth. It's that, yeah, it's OK. If I can't if I'm not going to do the one tooth that I can then only replace once in my life. I will do all of them at once. All the teeth. Making a better tooth than yeah. could be made otherwise. All 1,200 <laughs> teeth. <laughs> and even better than that, uh, I was reading some studies. The classic image of the dental battery was that it was essentially a brick. Yes. A, a solid structure that's just like you're just grinding bricks together. Yeah, like, like a whetstone. That is just here is this block of grinding surface. Yes. And you just rub it against the leaves, the, the plants until they're mush. However, research into the structure of the dental battery has found that it is, as multiple papers refer to it, a dynamic structure. <laughs> Developmentally, it's dynamic because teeth are being replaced. So like each tooth position is a conveyor belt of teeth kind of moving up the stack. Yes. But also the teeth themselves are connected to their neighboring teeth. With soft tissue, it seems, which allows a bit of flexibility oh. in the battery. And you'll like this. The paper that I read about this compared the tooth battery to two things. Shark denticles. <laughs> yep. And medieval armor. Yep. 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 <laughs> where you have rigid pieces in a fle in a somewhat flexible matrix. Yes. Which means that the tooth battery had a bit of flexibility to it mm -hmm. when it was being used. There's also evidence that the shape of the battery changed over the life of a hadrosaur as tooth replacement rates and positions would shift. So this, on top of all the stuff that we just said, it's not a brick. It's an ever-changing dynamic system of teeth. Yeah. Uh, which really drives your ant analogy home in a way that is very unsettling. Well, and the the image that came into my brain is comparing it to a brick would make their jaw much, very much like a vice where you have two blocks and you put them together. Yeah, chomp, says, chomp, chomp. Then you can slide it back and forth. There is a type of vice that some of you may have seen if you follow Adam Savage on YouTube. Uh, there's also other people. There's a re restoration channel that did one uh, called a fractal vice that has moving sections so that when you press the two halves together, they conform to whatever object you're vicing. So that if you put a wrench in there, it will grab onto the contour of the wrench. That makes their teeth much more like a fractal vice where when you bite something, you bite it in the way that thing needs to be bitten. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's intense. Yeah, I don't know if it's known how much. Yeah, it, flexibility. That's, it's not like those pin uh, 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 fidget. Yeah, that's that, toys like, or like your science. Yeah, yeah. Like children's museums. You where press you your face into it. <laughs> <laughs> you could just open a, a hadrosaur's mouth, press your face in, and there'd be it's just yeah, yeah, your impression. Your face. <laughs> Incidentally, don't push your face into those things. No. Do you know how many hands and faces have been on those things? <laughs> don't. They don't get cleaned. Just we, lots of open mouth kids. Blah. We've both worked at a place that has those. Don't. They don't get cleaned nearly often enough for you yeah, to put your face on you this. You clumb the clothes up and you just see a bunch of uh, howling faces <laughs> in the thing. You know, that's a lot of tongues yeah, I'm that's seeing. A lot of, uh, uh, also, don't press your face against the dental battery of a hadrosaur. Very unhygienic. <laughs> and also, uh, they, they're not meant to grind meat and bone, but they probably could. But go look up videos of deers <laughs> eating small animals. Yeah, I don't want to get bitten by a horse. Mm -mm. And this is like a lot of horses biting you at once. This is a lot. <laughs> this is this is a lot. This is an uber horse. Not only do they have extremely complex dental setups, they hadrosaurs also evolved very mobile jaws. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the past, sort of classically, it was thought that they their jaws moved in a very simple side to side or back and forth grinding motion. But there has been further analysis in recent years and modeling of the different bones and have found that there's a whole bunch of moving parts. Mm. There are a bunch of different hinges and joints between a bunch of different bones in the skull that allow different parts of the upper and lower jaws to move relative to each other, relative to the cheekbones and the brain case, 
all of which means that they were grinding their teeth when they were chewing in potentially a very complex fashion, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that it wasn't just up and down or side to side. There was a lot of different movement that they could achieve with their jaws. Which which is very interesting because like a lot of animals, they chew either side to side or back and forth. Mm-hmm. And when you look at their teeth, they fit together. like They slide against yes. each other one way. But if you're doing something like if you're moving more than one direction or something like what what would that look like? Yeah. What would that what pattern would that wear? Very interesting. Yeah. In the blog post, if I can, uh, there is a video that uh, I came across. Once again, Tom Holt's dinosaur class. Uh, that is a model of how some of those bones might have moved relative to each other. I'll try to put that in the blog post. <laughs> they uh, chewed in a figure eight. They chewed every direction. No, they spelled All their name this. while they were chewing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> One, I, I do like that. Hadrosaurs, there are tons of reptiles and other animals that have mobile jaws and lots of different parts of the jaw move in different ways. Fish do it. But uh, it is a thing that hadrosaurs kind of have in common (laughs) with snakes. And there's very little that hadrosaurs have in common with snakes. (laughs) Nothing I have said about hadrosaurs this episode almost entirely is something that you could also say about snakes there's very little good parents some snakes are go. very good parents and they do travel with their young rattlesnakes yeah uh, are, 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 they, they will like stick with their young for a while they both had scales they both had scales and ex- lived on earth existed in the late cretaceous <laughs> all together hadrosaurs are a- among the most specialized eaters of all time I'm thrilled that this episode is just a few after our herbivores episode, because this is a great follow up to like, all right, we talked about herbivores. Here's a group of animals that kind of perfected it. May have herbed herbed more herbs herbs. (laughs) than anyone else. They were the best herbivores of the whole time. (laughs) The teeth, the jaws uh, made them phenomenal chewers. Just really good at oral processing of food which is great for tough, fibrous plant materials. They also tended to be big, so they had a large gut capacity, which is also something that tends to be really good for eating lots of low-quality, high-fiber vegetation. They are also facultative bipeds. Yeah! Which means that while the big ones were mainly moving around on their all fours, they Even the biggest ones seem to have retained some ability to stand up on their hind legs, which also means that they had a wider range of plants they could reach in their environment. Yeah, yeah. They could go for things low down on the ground and up to, you know, a few meters or whatever above the the, the ground up into the trees. They were just, just like really good at herbivory. And there's a whole diversity of snout shapes and beak shapes that we see in hadrosaurs. So they were probably eating all sorts of different stuff between different species in different places. That was the thing I learned about them. And it was some documentary that like worded it in a particular way. But this was what I learned about them that made hadrosaurs so much cooler in my mind when I was younger. And it was describing the fact that they are... If there was a planty thing in front of them, they had the teeth to handle it. Yes. And just... I've never met a plant I couldn't chew. Basically, like, that portrayed them as, this was likely one of the reasons they were so successful, because there's no planty material on the planet that they, a member of them, couldn't make a food, make a meal out of. Yeah. And that immediately put them in the same category as like goats towards like oh man this is just the the all-purpose dinosaur like oh yeah if you've got a, a hadrosaur with you y- your caravan's good because you're gonna be able to move and they're gonna be able to eat yeah and you they'll just clear all the poison ivy yeah off the path and just it, it made the it put them in my brain as the sturdy di- like the reliable the dependable yes. dinosaurs and i i don't know why but that makes them so cool to me yeah, there was a study, we talked about it in the news uh, a few years ago, of a hadrosaur coprolite that had evidence, essentially the short version is that some hadrosaur chomped into a, a log. Yeah, yeah. They were eating dead, rotted wood. Yeah. And th- the reason it made headlines in part was because it had a bunch of bugs in it. So they were just chowing down on wood. And just processing uh, it. One other thing that I put in this section uh, the study that I saw that mentioned the gut contents of Leonardo, that really well-preserved specimen, mentioned finding 
uh, leaf fragments. And as they described it, uh, the leaves were processed to very fine fragments. <laughs> uh, and they, they did say in the paper what that says about their food processing in the mouth. Plenty more study will be needed, but it does at least preliminarily seem to support the idea that they were really good at grinding up food in the mouth. Yeah, they weren't just swallowing their salad whole. Yeah, that they were grinding it to fine pieces. <sighs> it, yeah, I don't know why. That, that is so endearing to me about them. I, they, I find it incredibly satisfying, just the idea that you would just see them somewhere and it's like, man, there's nothing to eat there. They're like, what are you talking about? There's green. Yes. <laughs> it it really does. Like when we think of ornithischians now, dear listeners, when mm -hmm. you think of ornithischians, there's the one with the horns and the ones with the armor and the ones with the plates and the ones with the dome heads and the ones with the super teeth. Yes. That's these guys. <laughs> you can't see the super. Like, yep, it's not yep. like Thera, like T-Rex where the super teeth are instantly apparent. Yes. You see them from across the room and you <laughs> shudder. Uh, but it's, this is one of the perhaps the defining feature of hadrosaurs as just an ecological force yeah. on Earth. I got a picture of someone seeing one like in the forest and being like, well, that one doesn't have any interesting going on. And then it just leans over and ch takes a bite out of a fallen <laughs> log. And you're like, oh, uh, okay, right. I'll be going this way. <laughs> and, uh, other direction. Now, I said that there are two things that I wanted to zero in on. Hadrosaurs are not nearly as famous for their teeth as they deserve to be. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, however, famous for their wacky heads. Yeah. Uh, hadrosaurs, as I mentioned, include two major subgroups. The hadrosaurines, which are often called the crestless <laughs> hadrosaurs, <laughs> and the lambiosaurines. Who do you think named those two? <laughs> Lambiosaurine. The, the humble hadrosaurs. <laughs> The high self-esteem hadrosaurs. <laughs> Lambiosaurines are hadrosaurs. The, the group, the whole group is famous for their head crests. Mm -hmm. This is the thing. They don't all have this. Right? Not all hadrosaurs have this. Not all ornithopods have this. So it isn't like the thing that hadrosaurs can all be known for. Yeah. But it is for sure one of the things that hadrosaurs are known for. These include a bunch that we mentioned before. Uh, Corythosaurus and Hypacrosaurus are famous cases where they have this tall, rounded crest, sort of like a helmet. Lambiosaurus uh, is also tall and round. Sometimes it's got a backward yeah. projection sticking uh, toward the back. Allura Titan has a broad crest that swoops backwards off the head and sometimes looks almost like a fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, off the back of the vertically off the back of the head. Parasaurolophus is the famous K, uh, the famous, perhaps uh, above all others, head crested hadrosaur. So Parasaurolophus mm -hmm. is famous for that long tubular crest that like gently curves off the back of the head. Yeah, the the uh, trombone. Uh, there are multiple species of Parasaurolophus. In some, the crests are shorter and more uh, dramatically curved. Others, it is that classic long, I think Parasaurolophus heads all together get up to like two meters long. Oh, yeah. With the head crest. Uh, incidentally, there is some evidence that hadrosaurines, the crestless hadrosaurs, might have also had crests of soft tissue. Oh, OK. Yeah, uh, yeah. At Montasaurus, there is some soft tissue evidence that it may have had a small crest, like a little bump on top of the head that was soft tissue. Okay, yeah, that, uh, not, that makes sense. Not a bony structure. In Lambiosaurines, these crests are formed, as, as, as far as I know, entirely or predominantly from the premaxilla and the nasal bone. So the, the premaxilla is right at the front of the snout, and the nasal uh, tends to be right behind that. If you think of like a horse or, yep, yep. or any long-faced thing, those are the two bones that border the nostril. Yes. And enclose the nasal cavity, which is why it's, those bones and they stretch back up the skull into these elaborate crests what, which just to give like a perception of of how crazy that is the premaxilla is is what makes up the front of of the mouth of of many an organism yes so that would be like us taking the bone behind our upper lip and stretching yep. it back it, into it, a giant crest it's the duckbill bone yep uh with the beak in the front of it so they didn't need to use it for chewing because they yes. had that big beak. 
These crests are, you know, there are tons of animals with crests, with head crests, with ornamentation. We did a whole episode, episode 140, about horns and antlers. We've talked in the Ceratopsians episode about their horns and frills. What makes the head crests of Lambiosaurian hadrosaurs particularly interesting is that they aren't solid bone. Mm -hmm. They are, there's space inside. They are hollow and they are specifically hollow with extended nasal passages. Yeah. The nasal cavity, the cavity that is accessed through the nostril, extends into those head crests. In Parasaurolophus, for example, at least in some species, I don't know if this is all of them, each nostril is associated with three nasal tubes <laughs> that run all the way up that crest. And some of them then run all the way back down. Yep. These long, convoluted... Uh, in fact, uh, Hypacrosaurus I saw described in one paper as having strikingly convoluted nasal passages. <laughs> the nose cavity extends into these crests. Now, here is another interesting point about these. Only adults had these. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Juvenile hadrosaurs, juvenile lambiosaurians, didn't have these big crests. And indeed, I wasn't sure if this was true. Indeed, there is at least one specimen of a young Parasaurolophus, and it doesn't have the crest. Yeah. Its crest is a, is like a little bump between yeah, the eyes. It's, it's adorable baby crest. The early stages of the crest. This is a feature that developed presumably very rapidly mm -hmm. when they reached adulthood. One thing very similar to a lot of horned animals today. Yes. Where the babies start out with little nubs and then they get big when it's time for them to use them. Yes. And speaking of using them, <laughs> I love that so many of the dinosaur episodes, we get to have at least one section where we get to say, what's that thing for? Yeah. What were you doing what with were you, that? What were you doing with that weird thing? And uh, th this has been one of the big with stegosaur plates and ceratopsian frills, hadrosaur head crests are one of the big debated back and forth structures in dinosaurs. There have been tons of suggestions and studies to try to determine what are you using these crests for. Uh, it is always fun to list some of the old bad ideas. I love these. A lot of the old bad ideas uh, for the hadrosaur head crests are related to that assumption that they were uh, swimming a lot. Yeah, yep. they were aquatic. Uh, there was the suggestion that they may have served as a reservoir of air mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, to sort of have extra air that especially for something like Parasaurolophus as a snorkel. Mm -hmm. uh, I also apparently it has been it had been suggested at one point that they may have stored salt glands. Oh, uh, for, you know, osmo regulation. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, none of this is true. Nope. Uh, they are not snorkels. Uh, there's no hole uh, that that does not work. Also, these animals were not. Uh, swimming. Nope. Uh, they were not uh, aquatic animals. It had also been suggested early on that they may have supported perhaps additional head or neck tissues or muscles or something, or even a proboscis. Yeah. Uh, this may have been musculature, muscle attachment for like a trunk off the nose. Yay. Uh, none of which is that that's not the shape that they have. They're not muscle attachments. Unfortunately. Which is a shame. No trunked hadrosaurs. <laughs> Another suggestion that has actually continues to this day to get, if not acceptance, discussion is the suggestion that it may have helped with smelling, mm -hmm. with olfaction. Uh, interestingly enough, hadrosaurs, as a general rule, have not only really big nostrils, but we have enough skulls to be able to look at the shape of the brain. Hadrosaurs have very expansive olfactory regions in their brain. Yep, yep. Like tyrannosaurs, yeah. like like animals that smell really well. So it, it certainly we know that they were really good smellers, although it has been pointed out that the olfactory region of the brain is similar in general size proportion, how much brain space it takes up in both crestless and crested hadrosaurs. Yeah. Which seems to imply that having a crest isn't really having an impact on your smelling ability. Yes, that that's not probably not its primary purpose if you were not yes. also boosting your, your computing power. Yes. Also, uh, uh, some evidence uh, apparently indicates that most of the tissue that is liable to be in those extended passages is probably respiratory tissue, not 
olfactory tissue. No, nah, there were there wasn't like smell sensors yeah. all through those crests. Makes sense. Another idea that we're moving more and more towards like good ideas. Uh, an idea that is, again, not like the first one you'll hear, but fairly well entertained, is that they may have helped with thermoregulation. Yes. We talked, we've talked about this in almost every dinosaur episode this comes up <laughs> because that's one of the things you do with a big wacky structure yep. is you use it to modify your body temperature. It's got a big surface area. You've got lots of uh, potentially vascularization, nasal passages. There are animals today and other dinosaurs that have complicated nasal passages that are thought to help cool or warm the air in various ways as it comes in or goes out of the body to help manage the temperature of the body, but especially the face and the brain and such. Yeah, yeah. many animals with complicated uh, uh, respiratory system in the skull to air condition the brain yes. or heat especially cold air before it comes into your body and you can imagine like if it's cold outside and you're standing in the sun and your crest is just soaking up the sunlight mm -hmm. and the air goes through the crest and warms up a little bit on its way in this is certainly considered a possible function of the crests hadrosaurs as i mentioned have big nostrils yep it, it could very well be that hadrosaur evolution of the skull in part was influenced by the need to thermoregulate, and that could have been part of early driving pressures in the development of expanded nasal regions, things like that. Well, it's, I had a similar thought with the sense of smell where like, elephants have an amazing sense of smell, but that's not why an elephant has a trunk. Yes. It, that's not the main usage of that trunk. Right. It but may have been something... Early on mm -hmm. in the evolution, maybe part of why the nose got bigger was to help with that. Exactly. But the trunk is not a smelling tool no. predominantly. It, it can do that very well. It also can do a million other things. It's also a hand. <laughs> <laughs> Precise. Like, like, our hands are good at clapping, but that's not why we evolved them. Yes. <laughs> but uh, when, whenever we see a big old wacky structure on a fossil animal, we often come down to... What is the most tempting and generally agreed upon, especially with these head crests, the most likely main function mm -hmm. of these crests, which is display. Yep. It's the same reason all those other animals with big head ornamentation, horns and antlers and ossicones, they are often related to display competition in some form or another. That especially syncs up with the fact that they're in adults, not the young. Yes, the idea that this is something that develops when you reach maturity because you don't need it before yeah, then. It's, it's evidently not affecting your survival to not have it when you're young, but it evidently becomes important when you get older. Yes, which is a pattern we see in tons of features that are sexually selected. Precisely. Horns, antlers, and so on. So th these really do fit... All the things you'd expect uh, them to have for display structures, they're very distinct between different species. They show up only in adults. One thing that doesn't seem to match some patterns of sexual selection is that as far as we can tell, both sexes have crests. Yeah, that's not just the displaying sex. Yeah, that it doesn't. There's not confident evidence to say that we've got dimorphism. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Now, it has been pointed out that there are tons of animals today, there are birds today, where both sexes have display structures and are both doing courtship, both involved in selecting mates. Mm -hmm. So this certainly could be the same thing. Many horned animals, both yep. male and female, will be equally horned. Uh, there does seem to be some evidence, in at least some cases of Lambiosaurians, where males and females might have slightly different shapes to the crests. Okay, yeah, yeah. So there may be some dimorphism, if not in presence absence, but in the shape and structure of the crest. Yeah, okay. So the crests, they could be thermoregulating, that maybe there's some sort of, they make you smell a little bit better yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah, they could have secondary effects, because like we talked about in horns, they will radiate heat in a lot of animals. Horns can be a way to get rid of heat. Absolutely. A lot of them use it as butt scratchers. Like Yep. There's other functions. You can use them for other things. But display as, as an identifier, either of your species or showing off to potential mates, is generally considered the 
predominant driving force in the evolution of the crest shapes. However, there is a slight complication. It has been noted as we look at different species of hadrosaurs and through the evolution of these hadrosaurs that the crest shape as it is changes between species, changes over evolutionary time, does not correlate always with the shape of the nasal passages inside of it. Mm -hmm. Crests that have very similar shapes, like Corythosaurus and Hypacrosaurus, can have different nasal passage configurations. And as Lambiosaurines evolve, the evolutionary changes in the crest shape don't line up with the evolutionary changes in the nasal passages all the time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which suggests that the shape of the crest and the shape of the nasal passages are being selected for different things. Yeah. That there is something driving the selection of the weird convoluted nasal passages. The piping. Now, this could be related to thermoregulation, right? How the air is passing through there to help to uh, warm or cool or whatever. But the most popular and fairly well-supported interpretation of this is that the crests were used as resonating chambers. Yep. That as air was moved through those crests, it would make noise, mm -hmm. allowing these animals to make big resonant calls across the open environments of the Cretaceous. Yeah, this is why they came up so much when we did bioacoustics. Yes, <laughs> episode 52. <laughs> Many animals have resonating structures. Uh, frogs, very famously, they puff out their throat flaps and it creates an area for sound to resonate. Lots of animals do this, so there is precedence for this. It is an excellent explanation for why you would have differing degrees of convolution for why the nasal passage structure seems to change independent of the shape of the overall crest. Also, people have made models yep. of the crests with the nasal passages, both digital and physical, to model the sound that would come out of them. And have found that, yeah, if you blow a bunch of sound through those, they make sounds. It makes noise. It resonates, typically creating low frequency sounds. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, which is common in large animals. Like elephants make very low frequency sounds uh, to communicate with each other. Yeah. Also, there have been some studies of the ear bones in these dinosaurs and found that the shape of their ear bones is good for low frequency hearing. Yep. Which is a nice other little piece of, yeah, you, you might've been making sounds with those big crests. Well, it's confirmation that if this did make that sound, you would be able to pick it up. Yes. You'd be good at listening for this sound. This is by far, these are the two big interpretations of those crests, that they are display structures visually and also that they are resonating chambers, which means that both of those functions are related to communication, perhaps courtship, perhaps communicating across long distances, which are very similar pressures. Yes. Uh, so it makes perfect sense that those kinds of things would evolve in tandem. This has led to tons of discussion, some of them on this podcast, mm -hmm. of what ridiculous sounds these lambiosaurines would have made. Well, and it also makes so much sense why the sh outer shape and the inner, you know, air, air, air passageways can be selected for separately because how I want this to look and how I want it to sound are not the same pressure and process. Yes. And so the structure of it can change independently. Yes. So uh, it's not a surprise to say that dinosaurs were probably vocal. Mm -hmm. uh, their relatives are all very vocal. These hadrosaurs may have also been specialized for uber communicating, yep. for making sounds. It's why when you think about being in the late Cretaceous, especially like North America or Europe, it is very plausible to imagine that, you know, you're sleeping up in your tree like Dr. Grant or whatever, and just hearing mm -hmm. these calls from the herds of hadrosaurs out in the nearby plains. There, there weren't really grassy plains, but, you know, out there in the place. I've always imagined them like an elk bugle, not necessarily sounding the same, 
but to where it's a noise because a lot of other animal noise it's like oh yeah that sounds like that was made by a throat like right yeah yeah, that, 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 that was a gurgle or a bellow yeah, or whatever. I can't make that, you know, bull noise they just did. But I, that sounded like someone yelling with. Uh, sure. And then you get to like an elk where it's like, nope, that's a woodwind instrument. Yep. That was not made by something organic. That's how I've always assumed Lambiosaurus would have sounded is that it would have just been this note that yeah. just cuts. It, and it's like, how is anything alive making that sound? Yeah, that's not possible. Well, and who knows? They could have been. These are relatives of birds. Yeah. Not too far off from birds. They could have been singing. They yes. could have been making songs. Oh, right? man. Birds make songs and whales make songs. Yeah, who knows? They could have been like changing the notes, doing different things. I wonder if there were any of that that uh, uh, learned their song and you know, stole pieces like some birds do. Yeah, listen, I, I, a liar, Lambiosaur. Yes, yes. absolutely. Uh, I did see it mentioned that uh, juveniles with their smaller crests and such are modeled to have made higher frequency sounds. So there may have been specific young communication, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which fits very nicely with the image of these being very social animals. Uh, and, and being good parents and stuff like well, that. It also makes me wonder if that was like uh, with the parenting, if that higher pitch was part of like triggering a parental response. Right. Like I, our babies. Yes. Do. And like uh, crocodilians, that's very famous mm -hmm. that yeah, higher pitches often triggers a specific response in parental animals because our brains are hardwired to go. That frequency means take care of it. Yep. That Get over there now. That, I don't care what you're doing right now. <laughs> Take care of whatever's making that sound. And then the voice drops and that part of the brain turns off. Yes. It goes up. Oh, you're now, fine. Now you're a teenager and we don't want to hear from yep. you. You're fine. You're doing OK. <laughs> uh, it does make one wonder if you did have one of those nesting colonies. Myasaurus is not in this group, but something <laughs> like that. Oh, they would have been so noisy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just constant <laughs> like when Like when geese migrate through an area and it's <laughs> yes. just a cacophony. But these would be like... A brass band, yeah. <laughs> well, <but laughs> nesting also, in your backyard. It makes you wonder how much of their noises we would be able to hear. Yes, I mentioned elephants. Ele a lot of the noises elephants make are infrasound. Yeah, yeah. We can't hear that noise. <laughs> just, just a herd of hadrosaurs moves through, and you just vibrate. Yeah, everyone just, just starts getting headaches. Just your and they're bones. They're just like ah, what? <laughs> it's like the um the, the infrasound that like certain fans and machinery can make. Yes. It like give people a sense of unease and, and yeah. whatnot and paranoia that you're just like, I don't know. I can't, I don't, I don't like it. Well, I don't know what, what it is. I hate it. What would happen is you wake up one day <laughs> and you get out of bed and you go, Oh no, the hadrosaurs are coming. <laughs> and you go, what? Yeah. The herd's coming back. There are a couple miles out, but I know I woke yeah. up with a, a sense of dread <laughs> and it means that they're coming. I had the hadrosaur why, dreams. Why are you dreading? I don't know. They're not dangerous. No, they're, it's they're, fine. We just stay away from them it's and just, it's fine. I just, well, just don't like them. <laughs> One last thing on a similar note to all of this, and it's a, it's a thing that I, I think is very interesting to throw here at the end. A lot of the studies of the crests and the nasal passages are achieved through uh, studying the endocasts, mm -hmm. CT scanning and all that inside the skull, from which we are also able to study the brain case, right? We learn uh, about their big olfactory regions. One thing that's really interesting about hadrosaurs is that, generally speaking, especially compared to other dinosaurs, they tend to be pretty brainy. Yeah. They have relatively large brains to their body size, and they've been noted several times to have well-developed uh, cerebra. The cerebrum mm -hmm. is very well-developed, which is something that we see in a lot of animals that exhibit complex behaviors. Yes. Now... We have talked at length on the podcast before. We did a whole episode about brains, episode 121. It is very difficult to look at the shape of a brain and go that link it to specific types of intelligence yep. or that you are smart or big brains don't mean smart. Certain yep. brain shapes don't mean smart. Smart is a but very it's... loose term that is difficult to just define in the first place yeah. the idea that you could scan a brain and get an iq score doesn't work because that's not how brains work and iq scores are not it's also not how iq scores yep work. yep like both of those aren't <laughs> how that works so no. yeah. all that being said hadrosaurs were probably pretty smart yeah uh they probably exhibited based on the brain comparing it to other dinosaurs uh one study that i found said that the most comparable 
other dinosaurs to their general brain shape and size are dromaeosaurs. Yeah, yeah. And other small, not not necessarily to the same extent as some of those, but some certain uh, theropods, smaller theropods, mm-hmm. many raptorans and such. Which very much syncs up with being very social. Yeah, animals. that's something we see in a lot of very social animals. Complex behavior. These are herding animals, mm-hmm. good parents. They're communicating in perhaps very complicated ways. It makes total sense that they would also be very behaviorally complex. Well, it's, you know, keeping track of all of the, the, the social dynamics of a herd, keeping, you know, being able to have a very complex, you know, courtship or, or mm-hmm. so that just takes a lot of brain power, even if they're not solving puzzles. Yeah. That's just a lot of brain power to keep track of all that information. So not only are they not boring mm-hmm. generic dinosaurs for all the reasons we've already discussed, they're probably also pretty smart dinosaurs. Yeah. Incidentally, while I was putting these notes together, that did make me think we have been asked multiple times. We've gotten this in Q&As on the podcast. We've gotten this in like in-person uh, presentations we've done where people ask, what would be the best dinosaurs to domesticate? Yes, I've been thinking that this whole time. Yeah, and we did an episode about domestication, mm-hmm. episode 27, where we talked about how there are certain features of a species that seem to make them really good at becoming domesticants mm-hmm. and being social, Yep, already having a sense of a dynamic, being relatively intelligent, uh, and having that that hierarchy and that recognizing cues and such. Well, and that means that, we can train s- yep. specific complex behaviors. Being trainable. Hadrosaurs seem to also have developed fairly quickly. Yeah, I had that thought when you mentioned that. They reached maturity at age three, which is pretty fast, which means that they we can breed pretty quickly. And it sounds like they are more likely to stand their ground and stand where they are than to be super skittish and run away. Yep, yep. Which also makes it a lot easier to take advantage of them. And uh, easier to feed. Like, they, they probably, it probably wasn't one of the, where I, I can only eat food off of this one bush. Right. You know, your teeth probably, that if I had greenery, you we can we can feed you. Yes. And, and now we're getting into a little bit, <laughs> this is a little bit the Mormon side, but why we domesticate things. Big and strong, Mm -hmm. workhorses, like you said, with goats clearing uh, away vegetation, and they would produce lots of meat. Oh, yeah. And eggs. I was about to say, (laughs) ask any any Tyrannosaur and (laughs) top recommendation for for meat quality. They seem to have all the same qualities as cows. Yeah. Plus they lay eggs. Yes. They don't give milk. That's I guess that's the trade off. Yep. Uh, You don't get milk, but you get eggs. You get omelets. You get it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, hadrosaurs, really cool. Yeah. Ornithopods, the whole group, very cool. Hadrosaurs, uh, truly underrated for how fascinating and interesting they are. Absolutely. They are one of my favorites, especially within regards to like the domestication conversation of like the Dinotopia style. There's just something about them that feels like we missed each other. That like yeah. we would have we would have synced up with them so well. I mean, we we would have absolutely like wiped out wiped species out. Yeah, and sure. stuff and done horrible things because we're humans. But like the the parts of it that were endearing would have been so endearing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, they are a very cool group. I love them as the like somewhat understated in that they're not flashy on the outside a lot of the time, but just so good at being dinosaurs. Yeah, and, yeah, they're great. We have as usual. Scratch the surface of what there is to say about hadrosaurs. Very cool group of dinosaurs. Uh, Big thanks to all thousand people who requested (laughs) this episode. We truly appreciate it. Before we wrap up our discussion, uh, before we leave dinosaurs completely, we have a patron question. Yeah. One of the benefits that you can get on Patreon is the ability to ask us questions that we will answer on the podcast if you are above a certain patron level. Will, I understand we've got a cluster of patron questions. We do. We have some some related ones. So we have two uh, from Mark and Colleen. The first asking, have there been any recent developments in sorting out all the non-hadrosaurian ornithopods? Relevant. Yep. And what is the current understanding of ornithischians outside the major groups, such as the heterodontosaurids? 
great questions. I, these questions have been sitting on the list for a little bit. I've been waiting for an episode like this yes. where we'll, we'll really uh, get to them. Uh, the first part of the question uh, we addressed a bit in this episode mm -hmm. that we've got these ornithopods outside of proper hadrosaurs, hypsilophodonts and thessalosaurs and orodromines and your uh, earlier iguanodontines. Uh, and as I mentioned, research continues to shuffle those around as we get a better or less defined idea of who goes where. Yep, yep. It seems like Iguanodontia is better resolved, uh, and it's really a lot of those early branching groups All right. that are really kind of confusing. They keep hopping around. And part of that is all the same troubles that we run into when trying to sort out basal ornithischians in general, getting to the second question, uh, which includes heterodontosaurs and a bunch of others like Pisanosaurus and Chilesaurus, uh, the Silosaurids, which are considered dinosauriforms, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or or maybe dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, maybe they're maybe they're early ornithischians. And that is part of the even broader all of this uh, is part of the bigger issue of just sorting out the earliest dinosaur relationships. Yeah. This, you know, it's it for as much as we know about the different groups of dinosaurs, the early evolution of dinosaurs and the early relationships between the different major groups is a major confusing cluster of different interpretations. Uh, it continues to improve. We, we are getting better at it with more fossils, but there's just so much unknown about how the earliest dinosaurs are related to each other, who goes in what group, which things are close to dinosaurs, which things are proper dinosaurs, which ones are early saurischians, which ones are early ornithischians. I will use this opportunity to remind everybody about that study from 2017 that proposed a rearrangement mm -hmm. of the dinosaur family tree. That's been in my back of my head this whole episode. Yeah, <laughs> that class like these days we often talk uh, interpret dinosaurs as sauropods and theropods are close to each other and then ornithischians are their own separate group the 2017 paper suggested ornithoskeleta we talked about this which suggested that theropods and ornithischians are close to each other and sauropods are their own branch also there's another arrangement mm. which is sometimes called phytodinosauria which was originally modeled in the 1980s that suggests sauropods and ornithischians are close to each other and theropods are on the outgroup, which didn't gain traction. But some recent studies have not said, hey, maybe that, but have pointed out that that isn't as poorly supported yes. as you might think that it would be. We shouldn't just ignore that. We're not saying put all your bets on it, but don't throw it out. <laughs> yes. This trying to sort out these relationships is complicated for a number of reasons. One, there's just limited fossil material yep. from early, early members of these groups. And when we do have fossil material, it tends to be relatively sparse or relatively incomplete. As we mentioned before, the farther back in the any lineage you go, the rarer and harder to find fossils it's going to be. But then also, one thing that comes up a lot with early dinosaur studies, and this is what we talked about with those early ornithopods, often you end up with a dinosaur. Yep. Like... Uh, in the ornithopod example, like Hypsilophodon or Thessalosaurus, or uh, among early, early dinosaurs, Eodromaeus or Chilesaurus, that are hard to place. Yeah. They have features that don't clearly fit into this group, this group, this group. Because, like you said before, they're from a time before all of those features had become distinct from each other. Yes. And then those, depending on where you place them in the tree can change the shape of the whole tree. Exactly. Yeah. Cause those are the, the early pieces. So if you look at this one dinosaur and you go, well, based on the shape of the vertebrae, it should go, uh, our phylogenetic study put links it with these other dinosaurs, which means that the whole dinosaur family tree is shaped like this. Yes. And then another study goes, well, we looked at the teeth and the teeth cluster it over here with this group of dinosaurs and that flips the tree, mm -hmm. and now it is different. So I, I, the questions, I guess, uh, were, how is it going <laughs> in dinosaur paleontology sorting out the early ornithopods and early ornithischians? 
And the answer is it's going. Boy, howdy, it sure is. It's going. <laughs> but it's it's just a very confusing region of the tree to try to sort out. Well, and another thing that I, I thought of when you mentioned that the iguanodontines seem to be a bit more, you know, more solid, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or, or agreed upon in their, their relationship and their organization, which made sense in my mind. Cause that's when they started getting really, really successful. Yep. So their fossils became more, uh, uh populous and common and widespread. And those features were now the features that were making them successful were now, now more notable so often when you're looking at the beginning of the group, you're also looking at before they hit their heyday. So you're not only dealing with older things that are less, have less of the features that you expect from the group. You're also looking at them before they made it big. So they aren't as likely to be in the right place to fossilize just because there's not as many as spread out typically. Yes. So if I were to look up the most recent paper and say, this is the arrangement that would probably change with the next paper that comes out. That would be a bit irresponsible to present it that Absolutely. way. Absolutely. And here. I have, I've done, I've tried not <laughs> yep. to in this episode. Well, yeah, nah, 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 these are all. And I, I, whenever we talk about this topic, I always want, I'm always cautious because mm -hmm. I don't want to make it sound like we just have no idea yeah. what we're talking about. Most of the dinosaur family tree is pretty well sorted. We're, we're shuffling around the little pieces in various major groups but like we we have a pretty good sense of the course of dinosaur evolution. It's just that every little shift that we make in the very early parts of the tree can have implications for the broad organization of the rest of the tree. Yeah. And it, a lot of different species keep getting pushed on either side of dinosauria or either side of ornithischia or outside of ornithischia. And it's going to keep. It's going to keep happening until we get really, really good fossil records of really early dinosaurs. It, it is often very tough to portray the these struggles in field. You know, all fields of science, science have this, but especially those that are you know, looking at things from a distance, the deep past and like space and stuff where mm -hmm. we know and understand a ton, an amazing amount. But there's still things that are very, very hard to just know. You know, like asking what color were dinosaurs? Some, we can give you some information about that on mm -hmm. some dinosaurs, but that's just a hard thing to know. Yeah. This is one of those where it's just hard to know because what we have doesn't make it easy to know this. Yes. So we've got ornithopods and then outside and in the base of ornithopods, there's a whole bunch of guys mm -hmm. and they're all within ornithischia. And then around the base of ornithischia, there's just a whole bunch of guys. And they're all within Dinosauria and around the base of Dinosauria. There's just a whole bunch of confusing guys. Yes. Uh, this is true of basically every lineage that we have any decent amount of information and fossil record for uh, it with dinosaurs. It's particularly notable because we actually know a ton about dinosaurs <laughs> and we have a lot of dinosaurs yes. and they're famous. Uh, so it, it it's kind of par for the course actually when mm -hmm. we're trying to sort out phylogenetic relationships it feels like it might just feel more notable because of the the extreme disparity between how good of a picture we have of later <laughs> ornithopods yes versus how poor their early picture is it just feels all that much like well Bebe, you have so much information here how yep. can't that give you that the answer? Because well, they weren't in giant herds all over the world, uh, leaving an incredible fossil record back then. <laughs> it was a different time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark and Colleen, for those questions. We appreciate it. Lots of fun uh, to talk about. And with the end of our patron question, we can go ahead and wrap up our discussion for this episode. This has been tons of fun. It's been a good one. Uh, hadrosaurs, as I mentioned at the top of the episode, the most requested episode topic to date. Yeah. Lots of people wanted this episode to happen. Uh, almost as many people as teeth. Almost. As <laughs> <sore mouth. laughs> uh, yeah, almost as many people <laughs> as half the number of teeth in one quadrant <laughs> of the mouth. Uh, well, half the number of tooth positions yes, in one yes, quadrant. Of, yes. It's a lot. Uh, to all of those people and everybody else, we hope that you enjoyed this. This has been a ton of fun. Uh, it is something we have said before. Cliche though it is, dinosaur episodes are always fun because dinosaurs are just so cool. Dinosaurs are pretty neat. They're pretty cool. 
Hey, every episode of the podcast has a blog post on our website. You can find a link to that in the episode description. The blog post has links to more info. Uh, maybe that video that I talked about, if I can uh, get a link to it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Also, uh, pictures of some of the stuff we've been talking about, uh, as well as other episodes you might enjoy uh, if you enjoyed this one. Don't forget, it is October. October! This episode comes out halfway through the month, which means that we are halfway through spooky season two episodes. Mm -hmm. By the time you're listening to this, at least two episodes of Spooky have been released so far this year, which means that we have uh, speculatively evolved two different categories of dragons. And they were delightful. Uh, They were so much fun. Conversation has already been happening in our Discord, where we have a spooky discussion channel. Please check it out. And if you are here, if this is your first time hearing that Spooky is happening, go listen to Spooky. Uh, And then don't forget, we've got a live stream. Yeah. uh, Spooky live stream coming up in early November. Also, uh, we made some changes to our website and some changes to our Patreon. There are two new tiers on our Patreon and we are doing a Patreon giveaway uh, around the beginning of next year. If you would like to have the chance to receive fabulous prizes uh, check out uh, the information is on our website. It's also on all of our social media places. Uh, if you become a patron, you might get some cool stuff. Now's a great time to do it with our big Patreon thing going on. Thanks again to all the people who requested this episode topic. Thanks again to all of our patrons of mm-hmm. any tier. Uh, we greatly appreciate your support. Thanks to everybody who listens to the podcast and says nice things about us. Even if we don't hear them, you only say them to your friends <laughs> or to your cat and special thanks. This is a new thing. We're doing a new thing to our top tier patrons who get a shout out in the end credits. This is going to be a thing now. Special thanks to Sarah May, Danielle, the bug lover and Robert Mart for your incredible support. Uh, we truly appreciate it. Absolutely. We release episodes every fortnight. That means two weeks from now, there will be an episode 177 of the Common Descent podcast. Maybe we'll let somebody else do the talking. Yeah. uh, For that episode. I'm tired. I was about to say, this was a a lot to talk about. You know, there's a mouthful. It is. Uh, is. (laughs) And I don't have the processing power (laughs) in my twofers uh, to... Also, we made a lot of noise. That's yep. also a Hadrosaur-related hey. thing. <laughs> uh, listeners, if there's a topic you would like to hear us talk about, uh, there's a topic request form. Uh, and you can find the link to the ep- that in the episode description. Uh, it is on our website, uh, and we'll get it, and we'll put you on the list, and then maybe we'll do the thing that you told us to do. You can tell that it's been yep, yep. Uh, it's starting to... That wasn't on the list. We structured the outro. Yeah, because we had new stuff. We had new stuff. Well, because we now we're doing this... We, we're yeah, doing the end credits, credits shout-out thing. Mm-hmm. And Will and I had a meeting earlier today. <laughs> and we mm-hmm. said, huh, that's going to have to go in a consistent place. Does this mean that for the first time <laughs> in six and a half years, we're going to have to impose some sort of structure on the outro of the episodes? Uh, and the answer was yes. Yes. I uh, didn't put the request thing in nope, there. We that should go in there. Uh, hey, if you want to request an episode topic, yeah, you can do it <laughs> on that thing. We're going to that's going to be part of the structure of the outro Dude, in the future. You just wait. Now, longtime listeners who may be sitting there thinking, what does that mean? You're not going to have long rambly outros anymore? Never. Absolutely not. We are, and, we're trimming all of that off. <laughs> that's exactly what we're doing right here. There, no more rambling. This, this is this is this. this It'll this ne- is our new streamlined outro. This is it. This it's is gonna it be, right It's going to be this every time. It's going to be like this from now on. Get used to it. The old days are over. Strap in. Hour and a half. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sign off, Rice. <laughs>